my signal. Unleash hell. Oh yeah, it's that time again. How you guys doing? Welcome to day five of your house arrest. Especially start calling this show house arrest. This is the Rational Mail. I am your host, Rolo Tomasi. Hopefully you can hear me over this. <laughs> Today we're going to be talking about does a woman's sexual past make any difference? I think it does. There we go. Hi, guys. See if I can put this back to where it needs to be. There we go. Hey, welcome. Welcome to, I don't even know what show this is. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, what, a, what, a, what a weird day for me today. I'm sorry, you guys. I, just a little bit of explanation here. Uh, the reason I, I set the uh, time back for this particular episode is because um, I had to drive... Uh, about an hour and a half down to go drop off some supplies for my mother um, and then drive another hour and a half back. So I needed a little bit of leeway to uh, get some other things in order before I could go do that. And I certainly couldn't do it in the time that I needed to. So I pushed things back. So, but everything's good. We're all, we're all good. Uh, for those of you guys who don't know, my mom is in a, um, she's in a, like an assisted living kind of place right now. My mom is like 80. She's going on 81 right now. And, um, the place where she's at is like on complete lockdown because if the coronavirus gets in there, it will pretty much kill every living soul in there. I would, I would suspect anyways. So, uh, what I have to do is I have to go down there and, um, drop off supplies, uh, you know, whatever she needs, um, and then leave a little bit of cash for her, give it to the people, and they, they take it in. And that's kind of weird for me because I'm used to going and seeing my mom at least once a week or, uh, you know, maybe once every two weeks. And uh, it's it's strange now um, because this we're going on almost a month that I haven't seen my mom, uh, you know, face-to-face. -face. And... Yeah. So anyways, that's uh, that's why I push things back a little bit today. But I don't think you guys mind because everybody's on house arrest. Right. This is our house arrest. Minus the uh, minus your little whatever tracking device around your ankle. <laughs> uh, I will say this. Uh, what was it last uh, last Thursday? Um, I was supposed to actually take my sled out. Uh, my birthday was last Thursday. Thank you very much for everybody. All of the well wishers. Um, I was going to take my uh, my snowmobile up to Mount Rose, and it was on Wednesday night that Governor Sisolak decided that he wanted to, um, uh, I guess, I guess, close down Nevada, the whole state of Nevada. So uh, I thought it best to stay in until I went and drove down to uh, Gardnerville today and realized that nobody cares. <laughs> Everybody's just driving around doing whatever they were doing anyways, and. Uh, I don't know if the church, I mean, it's Sunday today. I don't know if the churches are open, but um, that doesn't seem to phase anybody. Um, I mean, I, it's more of like a, um, an inconvenience right now. I'm 52, RF. Thank you very much for asking. Um, I know I'm, I'm a very young 52. I don't feel 52. I don't feel that at all. Uh, you know, they say you're as old as you feel. I've, how, do I, how old do I feel? I'm sure there's going to be all these kinds of insults. So, in fact, and to save you the trouble, yes, I, I realize I look like I'm still 14. So just, yeah, I've heard that one before. I've heard this before. <laughs> so anyways, uh, today, guys, we're going to be talking about um, does a woman's sexual past uh, make any difference? I might have Rich Cooper. He mentioned he might come on in about a half an hour and just join me. Uh, my, any, any one of the guys from Rule Zero might show up, too. Uh, if the spirit moves them, maybe, maybe not. Uh, we'll see. Uh, I I, I want to explain like why I'm doing this first. Um, uh, a lot of people say, well, haven't you done this before? Well, yeah, I have done this before, but I think there's kind of like a new interest right now because um, women, I think, in the post-virus world are starting to uh, wake up to the fact. I, I hope they are. I, it seems they are. It would seem like 
I don't know. Maybe it's a maybe I'm being too logical. Maybe this is too much of a logical progression. Maybe here I am using reason once again with with a, a feminine mindset. But uh, it would stand to reason that women need to at least in some way start considering uh, what I call value added. <laughs> and part of that value added is uh, sort of saving the best. And uh, we'll I'll explain to you what that exactly means here in just a moment. Um, if you guys are a uh, are you know, long-time readers of my my blog or you've read my book, I have a, a, a post called um, Saving the Best. And Saving the Best was one of my seminal posts. And I didn't expect it to be. I really, what's funny is when I wrote that post, it was just sort of a, I don't want to call it a teardown or a breakdown uh, post, an essay on my blog. Uh, I think I put it out about 2014 or 2015, somewhere around there. And it was just in response to what I was seeing a lot of, and I was actually, I've heard the story quite a bit, but I was reading it a lot on Reddit at the time. And it was pretty much, uh, the, the, I'll just give you the quick breakdown. It was uh, a guy who was married for about like three or four years, uh, was sort of in a lackluster, sexless, kind of starfish, kind of vanilla sex uh, marriage with a, the woman who swore up and down that she wasn't sexual or she was just not into it like she used to be and she, how she was so crazy in her uh, college years and um, apparently the guy had found an old videotape I mean like a tape tape of this woman that he had married uh, having like three ways with guys that she knew in college and you know wondering he, he approached everybody of course on on reddit this was I, I don't I want to say this was on the Red Pill Reddit when before before the Red Pill Reddit was quarantined, which was over a year ago. And by quarantined, I mean Reddit actually just basically shut down that sub um, unless you are already a member there. But back in those days, we could actually have an open conversation about things like this. And, um, and so uh, the guy was just sort of. Uh, throwing it out there looking for advice like should he should he dump his girl should he not um, and then of course she found out uh, he confronted her with it and now of course she well I mean after after the fact I'm sure they're probably divorced by now I would like to I would think they probably are but um, that was a real seminal post for me because a lot of guys I think really it resonated with a lot of guys and I um, I, I started uh, getting a lot of other guys with a similar story. And remember, that was back in like 2014, 2013, 2014, somewhere around there. And uh, the guy was talking about like old videotape, like not like uh, not like digital video. We're just talking about like a, a, a tape that she had kept or held on to since I guess the late 90s or something like that. And, um, you know, of course, the, the, the real question was, is why is she hanging on to stuff like that if it was like so, you know, uh, mentally scarring for her, if that was the case, um, and then that, of course, factored into it. I go. I, I've actually, uh, if you look in the description here, uh, I in the relevant links. If you want to go read that, it's already in the relevant links because I knew I'd be talking about that today. So I've been talking about this subject for quite some time. Um, Saving the best also made it into, I believe, book two as well. So uh, if you are familiar with what I consider like saving the best, now why did I why did I call it saving the best? Well. The reason I call it saving the best is because I think that a lot of guys, particularly with a beta mindset, um, tend to think that, uh, or they look at marriage and they look at love in very idealistic sort of rose-colored glasses, not the red pill lens that we are so used to today. Um, remember, this is six or seven years ago when I was writing this and was just sort of discussing this. Um, and so... At the time, the the response, at least from women and from a lot of really more, I, I want to say, uh, beta men or blue pill guys at that time, they had a problem with the guy. They had a problem with the husband because, you know, he should have known what he was getting into. And so now it becomes a, a question of personal responsibility. And he should have known better than to marry uh, a whore or whatever, you know. And I mean... How do you, especially if you're if you're a blue pill beta guy, you're sort of looking at a marriage from the respect that if a woman says, "Hey, I want to be with you for the rest of my life. I want to start a family with you. I want to, um, uh, you know, I want I want to be with you for the rest of my life." I think guys sort of think that they, if a woman says yes to a lifelong commitment with a guy, that that guy 
must therefore by nece- like necessarily be uh, the best that she can do. And again, this goes back to the, the old hypergamous doubt question. Is he the best I can do? And uh, I think that at some point, particularly when a woman gets into her epiphany phase, like I said, there's that kind of compromise that a woman has to go through. Um, and so while she was having three ways in her college years when she was so crazy and now she's over that and now she's got herself right with God and now she's somebody who's, you know, she's completely different or I, you know, she wants to do things the right way now. Um, I'm not, I'm again, remember when I'm talking about this, I'm not saying that women have some sort of fiendish plot to, to sort of, uh, manipulate and exploit beta, beta male blue pill guys at a, between the ages of like say 29 and 31. Uh, I think that during the epiphany phase, and I, 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 by kind of, by association, I'm probably going to talk about the epiphany phase a little bit here too, because I'm trying to add something a little bit more to this now, because like I said, this is six, seven years ago, I hear this conversation coming up now. And that's why I, I, I wanted to cover this. I wanted to talk, talk about this today because I didn't have a podcast. I didn't have a, a live stream. I didn't have a, a a vlog <laughs> back then. So now I can sort of take questions about it and, and we can sort of discuss it, I think, in, in a little bit more detail. So um, so what happens is, of course, that you know when women get to be in that epiphany phase, uh, and I get this a lot from guys who, particularly purple pill guys, who will say, well, Rolo, don't you think that they're honest and they really think that? Can a woman really have a change of heart? And then my answer to that has always been, yeah, yeah, it's very convenient. And it's very, uh, it's very hamstered, you know, hamster. I when we talk about the, 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 you know, the rationalization hamster, in in women's sort of hindbrain. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure if you were to ask women during the epiphany phase if they genuinely wanted to get right with God and do things differently and make the guy wait for sex and and make the beta guy jump through hoops so that he, you know, she doesn't seem like she's easy and he, you know, has to prove himself because that's what most beta blue pill guys want to do at that age. Um, to you know, say, hey, I'm I'm the best choice for you, baby. And then she suddenly she's open to those things. Yeah, I I have no doubt if you were to, you know, if she were to take a polygraph test, she would pass it. She genuinely probably feels that way. My question isn't like, is she like, you know, fiendishly going, hmm, can I, can I, can I put one past this guy? That's that's not what my I mean, maybe there's some that do that, but I'm just saying that I don't think women actually do that. I think that at at that time they honestly think this, but my point is why why then why that mentality why all that you know the the social conventions that sort of circulate around that era at that time so if you've read my second book um uh, the preventive medicine and you look at the timeline that i i have in there i'm I'm, god damn it i didn't put a uh i should have put the I promise I'll I'll give you a a a graphic representation of this. But if you if in book two there's a, a timeline in book two, and right around that timeline is when women sort of look for more long term security. Right around 21 to say 31 year or excuse me 29 to 31 years old, which I peg as the epiphany phase. Um, that's when women sort of want to push past or get past. They 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 like to to present the idea at that time that they. Uh, they have matured or they have grown or they don't want that. They, they, they realize really that they can't lock down the, the alpha guys that they had the, the three ways with and they had all the, you know, the, the sexual past with and they want to have some sort of absolution for that. And uh, that sort of brings me to the topic today. Um, and when I say this, when I talk about a woman's sexual past, it's uh, for a guy to actually even have a, a concern about that, particularly today, is something that is really uh, it's it's a hard conversation to have for guys because they're shamed for it, and it goes hand in hand. If you if you watch the uh, the show that I did on Wednesday when I talked about uh, you know shame common shaming tactics of women, this is one of those shaming tactics that. Uh, it shouldn't matter what her sexual past is. It shouldn't matter who she had sex with in the past because that's the past and this is the now. And really, I think probably in her head and because we live in a gynocentric social order and there are social conventions that are ready to reinforce that decision for her to sort of uh, mature. And I'm, I'm done with those jerks and I'm done with the, the past life that I had before and I'm done with all that. Now I want to you know look forward to having a family and I want to... Uh, a husband and I want a guy who can, you know, take care of a family looking for that long-term security. Now the, the beta bucks, um, 
you know, side of hypergamy comes out because she realizes that she can't maintain that alpha, uh, alpha seed side, this uh, the short-term sexual side that she was so so easy. It was so easy to do when she was, say, between the ages of like 21, well, probably 18, and uh, you know, 26, 27, 28. So um, it's important to understand what the epiphany phase really is first. Uh, epiphany phase, like I said, is that time where a woman uh, realizes that she can no longer get with the guys that she would have liked to, the exciting, fun guys, and now she's looking for the long-term security. Well, here's, here's the problem with that. So if you read the, uh, just to start off with, if you need a primer for this, go and read the, uh, Saving the Best. And the reason why I called it Saving the Best is because idealistic uh, blue pill beta male guys believe that if a woman says yes to him, generally believes that if a woman says yes to him, that he represents the best sex that she can get or the guy who satisfies that hypergamous uh, equation, right? Like, is he the best I can do? I think on some level of consciousness, particularly from an idealistic beta blue pill mentality, those guys believe that they are the best and that she has been saving that sexual best for him until he finds out what her sexual past really is. And I think that at a point right between, say, 29 and 31 at that epiphany phase right there, that's when um, that's when women are really hoping that the guy that that they think as think of as the long term secure the best long term security provider that they can get with that guy, they're hoping he remains ignorant. And I've said this before, kind of jokingly, but now I'm going to be a little bit more serious about this. Is that one of the most important things that guys can do right now? If you're reading my books, if you're watching, if you're in any way, I don't have to read my book. If you're in any way involved in, uh, you know, red pill you know, praxology, if you're in any way a, a, a student of intersexual dynamics, you need to do yourself the favor and understand uh, the nuts and bolts of how women actually work and what their plan is and what the, uh, the idea, the ideas that they use to sort of absolve themselves of that sexual past so that they can move forward. And they expect you as the guy to accept that right now. And the best thing that you can do, I think, as a guy is to make yourself aware, to become red pill aware, because right around that time when guys get to be about, uh, like, say, 28 to 29, 30 years old, suddenly they find that women who wouldn't give them the time of day before suddenly see them as a really good prospect. Hopefully they do. I would say maybe in the past, m more so in the past than they do right now, although here's the reason why I'm talking about this, is that going forward in a post-virus world, I think you're going to see that women are going to look for those guys, those security providing guys, the guys who have who are essential, right? the guys who have the good job, the guys who are going to be able to sort of help them prosper and uh, be a good provider, a good provisioner in the future are going to be a little bit more attractive. Now, I didn't say arousing. I said attractive to women, particularly in the epiphany phase right now. now the problem with that, and I said this uh, earlier today or earlier um, in the week, uh, if you guys have not watched uh, Donovan Sharp's show uh, where he was talking about, um, he was doing a breakdown. I forget the actual title of the show, but I came in like for the last like uh, 10 minutes of that show maybe, and he was dissecting a video of this girl who was talking about exactly this topic, which is guys shouldn't care what a woman's sexual past is. And what that is really is a plea for ignorance. It's a plea for guys who are good providers, who would make good, long-term, secure relationships for them going forward past their epiphany phase, let's just say beyond 30, okay? Uh, Hopefully, hoping that those guys are still ignorant. And if they're not ignorant, if they are red pill aware, even if not, even if they haven't read anything in you know red pill literature or whatever, that even just like having those assumptions or not wanting to get with a woman who is, say, like a single mother or not wanting to get with a woman who has a sexual past, that if they have a problem with that, that's a problem with those guys. And so consequently, when you see these threads, when you see these videos, like I said, I was talking about this on Donovan's show for like the last 10 minutes. And I think I want to say it was Friday show. 
I'm pretty sure it was Friday's show. Um, and uh, so I was uh, I, I'm basically just breaking down what I wanted to talk to you guys about today. So, um, But going forward, the idea is this, is there's a certain dependency I think women have, particularly in Western cultures. And yes, I know this is a, this is a cultural thing, but remember, we are exporting Western feminism. We're exporting Western gynocentrism all over the world right now. So it's not just an American thing. It's not just a Westernized thing. It's it's being disseminated slowly but surely. So it is applicable to you if you are not living in this country as well. It's something to remember, something to keep in the back of your head that during that time when a woman gets to be about 28 to 29 years old, they are hoping that you are going to still be ignorant ignorant of intersexual dynamics, ignorant of a woman's nature, ignorant of the uh, mating strategies that women have, ignorant of hypergamy, and ignorant of the schedule that she follows, that timeline, like I said, that I, I, I laid out in the second book, hoping that you are going to be ignorant of all that so that when you get to be 30 and she suddenly has some sort of interest in you that you think it is flattering to your ego, that you say, ha, finally, I've hit pay dirt. Finally, all of this is paid off. Finally, all of my dedication to myself and my dedication to uh, my blue pill idealism and, uh, uh, you know, maybe it's purple pill, who knows, but all of my dedication to everything that I thought was so very, very important. Now, the girl who wouldn't give me the time of day when I was 22, now that I'm 30, now she wants to get with me. Now, this also is a sort of an unfunny joke, which is the uh, will you wait for me joke. And we used to, you know, it's, what, what I thought was interesting about this is like, this was actually a joke that was in an old episode of Friends during the 90s, where I think it was like Ross and Rachel were, um, were going on a break. We're on a break. Remember that? Uh, maybe you do, maybe you don't. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm showing my age a little bit here, but the, 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 the sort of the humor to all of this was uh, she said, well, you know, uh, we were on a break. I don't want to be with you now because I'm young and I want to, I want to play the field, blah, blah, blah. But tell you what, if we're both, uh, single and unattached or whatever at 30, then we'll get married. Now that w back in the nineties, we're like, ha ha ha, that's great. But now from a red pill aware perspective with a red pill lens, it's one of those things where we, where we talk about like how old media like old songs, old ballads from the 80s, old movies, and yes, old sitcoms from the 80s and the 90s, suddenly with a red pill lens, those don't look so funny anymore. They look pretty manipulative is what they do look like because now we have, we're have we in a new order right now where we can sort of gather all, a, a lot more information and a lot more data about um about uh, you know human nature, women's nature, and we can see from sort of the the devastation of people's lives that that's an unfunny joke. Because again, as I keep telling you guys, when you get to be about thirty years old, if you're a guy and you you have your you know you you've done a lot with your potential, and you're doing more with it, by the time you get to be your mid thirties, that's when you're going to hit your your peak sexual market value years but remember that when you get to say 36 37 years old maybe I'm, let's say 35 36 years old um if you have made the most of your potential you will be at the point in your life where you have the most sexual selectivity meaning that you can go back and say ah oh, well there's women who are 25 years old i'm 35 years old and uh they're hot young and tight and if they're smart around that age, let's say 25, 26, 27 years old, maybe they see me as a better choice as a long-term provider. Well, okay, if that's what you want to do, fine. If not, then you just, you, you can play the field and spin plates. Great, whatever. But the, pro, the, the point I'm making is that when you get to be 36, uh, you know, 35, 36 years old, that should be where you have maximized your sexual market value potential at that time. So, that's the thing that's sort of like this the dirty little secret that women don't want you to know is that once you get to be about 30 years old hopefully you're still ignorant where a woman is kind of on the de the decline of her sexual market value i'm not saying she hit the wall right there i'm just saying that she's on the decline it's and and decline begins up here not here like there's plenty of good looking girls i've I, that are you know 29 30 years old not as good looking as maybe they were when they were 22 but remember, it's not just a physical thing. It's a woman sort of acknowledging that her 30 or 32-year-old self is not going to be as sexually competitive as her 22-year-old self. 
That's why they, that's my joke, right? That's why they call it forever. The sh they call the store forever 21, not forever 31 <laughs> and not forever 41. They call it forever 21 <laughs> because that's the age that women want to get back to because they know that that was their peak years. So those, you know, right in there, 21 to 23, somewhere in there were, were their peak sexual market value years. And they want to get back to that because that represents fertility blah 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 okay so this is kind of remedial stuff so i'm not going to get too much into it but i the reason why it's important the reason why a woman's notch count is important or is sort of i want to say instinctively naturally important to a guy is because it's because that 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 sexual history that sexual past right there it, it makes a difference naturally instinctively but it also makes a difference sort of cognitively as well what women are hoping for at that time is that you will either be ignorant of that or you'll be ashamed to have a concern about that. And that's where we see uh, most women going today on Twitter, on Reddit, on, on YouTube. When I was talking uh, with, with Donovan on Friday, the same place that that woman went, she was just like a woman. She was a young girl. She was probably like maybe 20 or 21 years old. She, she couldn't have been more older than my daughter. And she was just losing her mind that guys would ever have a problem with a woman who had a notch count of like, say, over 10. Now, there's other reasons for that as well, and we'll talk about that. Yes, I know. I'm sure it's going to come up here in the chat. Well, you know, women can't form, you know, strong, healthy bonds, and, and you know, women with higher notch counts have a higher incidence of divorce. Yeah, yeah, they do. Okay, why? Why do they have a higher incidence of divorce? Remember, we're always looking under the hood here at the rational male, right? We want to know nuts and bolts. We want to know why the car runs. <laughs> Not that it runs. Why does it run? How can we tear it down and put it back together again? So when we say, well, a woman who has like, what is it? I think if it, any, I'm, I have the stats here too. I probably, I'll, maybe I'll call them up and put them on a the screen here. But like the stats are this, is that pretty much if a woman has more than like, say f a body count or notch count, end count of like three or four, that between like, say five and seven or 10, something like that, uh, a woman's incidence of divorce, like like skyrockets and oddly enough that when a woman comes down from like say to like she has 12 or more it drops a little bit but it's still pretty hot so much higher than if a woman had only one sexual partner or she had like maybe two or three so there is a there is a uh, um, there's a, a a statistical you know empirical data that we can see now here in our new order in our you know our, our wonderful google age and our our internet age we can we have access to these stats now and we can use them and say hey this is maybe this is something a criteria that you as a guy maybe when you're 35 36 years old that you want to uh you know keep under your hat for vetting a woman right so you meet a woman who's 20 25 years old she's only got like three sexual partners okay maybe that maybe that's your limit i don't know what your limit is most guys particularly trad con guys particularly the moral absolutists it's like the only thing that they could possibly get. i gotta find a virgin bride all and let me tell you right now the likelihood of you finding a virgin bride in this day and age is next to none next to like zero okay unless you're in some orthodox religion yes 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 i got that but let's be realistic here again we want to want to be as rational and pragmatic and realistic as we possibly can you're probably not going to be the guy to put the first flag on the moon okay some guy was there before you we'll talk about that here in a little bit but before we get into that i want to um i wanted to talk about um uh, saving the best part first because most blue pill beta guys a hallmark of this beta thought is this ideal that if a woman says yes to him that he must by default, must by necessity, be getting that woman's sexual best. That she, it, like she's she's forsaking all others. She's she's not if she's going to be monogamous and she's going to be a wife and she's going to you know go along with the deal, which is you know you can we can argue about whether it's worth it or it's not. I'm just saying that if that's the decision that's being made, uh, yes, it makes a difference. And so. When guys get into that situation, I think what they believe is, is that, well, she wouldn't be marrying me if I wasn't the best guy for her. No, most more often than not, we don't marry our best sex ever. Okay. And when, uh, unless I like, uh, in my, 
in my fourth book, I talk about this a little bit when we when I talk about premarital sex and why it is that there's a stigma against premarital sex or why we have um, prearranged marriages. What, what's the logic behind prearranged marriages? Well, prearranged marriages seem like an atrocity today because we prioritize romantic love above marriage. If you've read any Dal Rock, you'll understand what I'm talking about is that um, we have uh, we've made uh, romantic love the prerequisite for marriage rather than marriage for the place as a place or as a an environment for romantic love. There's a, there's a difference between those two. Um, again, I, I don't want to go into too much detail because I talk about this in, in book four and it would probably be two shows long if I were to talk about it. But just understand that uh, one of the I, I when I'm talking about premarital pre, the premarital sex in the uh, in the fourth book, I'm talking about it from a perspective of why it would exist in the first place. What would be the big deal about it? And I have Rich, who's just decided to come on, and I don't know if he's ready for me. Um, let me let me look at a, a few of these real quick. Uh, Renegade says one of my good friends married a woman who was 38 years old. He was 42. He has a, he is a great guy, owns his own business. Every time she gets mad at him, she throws the better men she was banging in her youth uh, that could, that she could have gotten. Okay. This is a, um, this is a very common uh, tactic, I think, for women who have that regret. Now, there's a, there's a side of women who, well, I'll say this, when women get into marriage, when they decide that they're going to, they're going to be with one guy, um, Remember, there's that hypergamous doubt. When a woman gets into her epiphany phase, she has to decide uh, against two things, uh, the alpha seed and the beta need. Do I really want to be with this guy, even though he's not as exciting as all the guys that I had sex with back in my party years? Well, for the most part, women, you know, for the most part, women can't answer that with the beta guy that they are marrying at that particular time. Now, I'm going to bring Rich on here real quick. What's up, man? What's up? How you guys doing? Hey. In you there? <laughs> yeah, I figured I'd sit on the deck. It's, the snow's pretty much all gone, and it's starting to warm up. So I'm trying to spend yeah, some we're time outside some weather here too. Hey, so Rich, we're talking about uh, a woman's sexual past, and yes, we're talking about why it's important and why it's why why is it a stigma right now? We don't have a lot of stigmas these days, but mm -hmm. most of the stigmas that we have are are especially in a gynocentric social order really focus on men. And I think you have I, like every time you go and you put out a um, uh, a list of standards or something on, you'll end up getting uh, you know a thousand retweets, and it'll make the six o'clock news because a, a man dared to have standards on. Uh, how on, dare you? Uh, how dare you? Um, well, one of those things I think is really a guy saying, you know what? I don't want to be. I don't want to settle down with. I don't want to get with a woman who is. Who has a certain notch count, or has is has had a body count of you know whatever? Yeah, and, I think men inherently don't want to be with a woman that's been with everybody on a long term basis. Mm -hmm. Fun time is okay, you know she's mm -hmm. got some experience. But if anybody's looking for anything more than fun time, then um, it should be something that matters. And don't let anybody tell you it shouldn't matter because it does matter mm -hmm. for a whole bunch of reasons. I, I think instinctually it matters to guys. Now there's there's sort of the there's sort of the hindbrain side of things for guys where we I, I you know we talk about this all the time, particularly in the red pill side of things, where like and you've done you've done uh, actual uh, talks about this about not getting with the married or not getting well the married woman, but not getting with the single mommy. Mm -hmm. uh, guys have an innate I think an innate uh, hesitancy to get with a woman who already has children. Now, mm. if the guy is desperate, if the guy is blue pill, if the guy is beta and he sees that as his best option, he might be able to push past that. But I think that on some like level of consciousness, guys have at least a hesitancy to get with a woman who, is, who has had a lot of partners, who looks like she uh, gets around. Um, and I'm not saying that like, like guys don't want to get with a loose chick. I mean, we... Uh, you know, guys want to get with uh, you know unlimited access to unlimited sexuality. That's why pornography is a big deal. But there's that side of it. But then there's also the side where it's like, well, what do I want to invest myself in? So when a guy decides that he wants to get into a long-term relationship, that's when he has that hesitancy. So there's mm -hmm. that there's that side of the guy who says, you know what, I want I want variety, and I want to bang a lot of women, and I want to have a, a experience. 
girls. But then there's a then there's a side that well maybe while she's fun in bed it doesn't mean she's going to be a good mother for your child. It's the Madonna whore complex. So uh, it's I, I'm and some people will say that this is sort of congruous. I think with um, the alpha seed beta need right where uh, women want the guy who's the hot you know fun fun in bed alpha Chad versus the guy who's the good you know it's cads versus dads the guy that versus the guy who's going to be a good provider for her later on I think there's sort of a parallel to that in men's nature as well but the problem is is that men are not allowed to have that today that's the that's the that's the key issue right here is you're not allowed to have any well first of all any standards but you're certainly not allowed to have a problem with a woman who has a lot of partners and we're supposed to be in some way forgiving of of that yeah they want you to overlook that um i mean we've known that for a while we've, we've talked about this you know, we've had this conversation many different ways slicing mm -hmm. and dicing it uh many different times but yeah they they want you to overlook her flaws mm -hmm. um all the time but she's got a little patience for overlooking yours especially mm -hmm. as you get older um you know women tend to overlook um indiscretions or or flaws that might carry around in their 20s but as you get older they just don't have the patience for it yeah carnival here says this and this is this is very true this is the first place that women will go when they attack you for really kind of any kind of shame is you're insecure in your masculinity if you are a more secure man my notch count would not matter to you and in a is sense, that a handbook that they that they pass out to women somewhere I, when I they get their know. feminist card or something or i have no idea um but it's definitely part of that social convention, which is men should not have a problem with that. Now, what I want to talk about is why, why would a guy even instinctually have a problem with a woman who is a, a stereotypical slut or a stereotypical loose woman or a, 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 a chick who is – uh, who gets around now? I the reason I wanted to I, I'm glad you came on when you did because I was just about to read this and I'll 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 throw this one on the screen here really quick. Um, let's see where did I put that? I think this is it. Yeah, there we go. So I I received this uh, prior to this show and I wanted to read it here. This was a uh, this was from. I don't know if this is Am I the Asshole or whatever, but this is from a, a Reddit thread and it says a fiance male found out about my 28-year-old female college days. Hasn't talked to me in three days. I don't know if this is the end. Okay, so here's the story. I've been with my fiance for two years, engaged for two months. I can go on and on about how great he is, but I won't waste your time. He's awesome. Him and my sister's boyfriend have gotten really close over the year, and they talk at least twice a week, whether on the phone or on FaceTime, just hanging out. Sister has been with her boyfriend since high school, so obviously her boyfriend knows me very well, uh, as well as my dating history. Uh, last weekend, because of the quarantine, we were all together, and we thought it would be fun to drink and hang out on FaceTime. It was a FaceTime double date, and we all had a blast. Laughing, playing, drinking games, we all partied for over an hour <laughs> online, I guess. Uh, I was over it, and I decided to leave the party uh, directly without the boys in another room. Well, my fiance and her boyfriend stayed on FaceTime and continued to get drunk together. During this time, I couldn't hear shit because I was uh, in another room talking to my sister. Uh, sister's boyfriend goes and uh, let's see what sister boyfriend goes and tells a bunch of stories about my college days and how many guys I hooked up with. Just so everyone knows, I don't know the actual number, so she doesn't even actually know what her notch count wow. is. Wow, that's <laughs> my, a big number. My first three years of college was literally one giant party. Uh, without being too descriptive, I admit I was excessive, quote unquote excessive. Uh, but at the time, it was just what we did. I was single during all that time, and me and my friends did a lot with, uh, with lots of guys. Uh, most of them I couldn't even pick out of a lineup, but again, I was in college, all in caps. <laughs> that, so as if that's like in some way, uh, you know, uh, I guess a caveat of some sort. Uh, anyways, one of the parties uh, I went to ended up hooking up with four different guys at the same time. This is relevant later. My fiance has is a handsome, is handsome as fuck, and I know for a fact that he's been with several women. We talked about our past a lot in the beginning of our relationship. I wasn't 100% honest with mine, and I can only assume that he was. After everyone hung up, me and my fiance were laying in bed and about to sleep when he just calmly asked me, did you get gang banged in college? 
My response was, why would you ask that? That's when he told me everything that my sister's boyfriend had told him. He told me the details I'm not even sure are 100% true because, again, it's all a blur. Uh, but a lot of the info was accurate, and so I just told him yes. I told him uh, I was the – it was at one time. It was one time. <laughs> just the one time, Rolo. One time. I swear, yeah. it only happened once. Uh, he continued asking questions about the other stuff, bit, but because – uh, you know, about the the gangbang thing kept coming up and uh, and he had a lot of questions about it and uh, that I answered to the best of my knowledge. Fast forward to Wednesday. Things had been fine and normal until our Sunday, Monday and Tuesday, but on Wednesday, radio silence. I guess he's ghosting her. He hasn't texted or, or talked to me in three days. The breaking point was tonight when he came home from work and uh, and he asked me, are you friends with any of the guy, of those guys on Facebook? Again, not lying to him, I admitted that yes, I was friends with all of them. <laughs> he left a few hours. He left a few hours ago. I have no idea where he is or what he's doing. I'm tempted to call the cops, but I feel like that will just make it worse. I feel like garbage. I fucking hate my sister's boyfriend right now, but maybe it's not even his fault. Maybe I should have been more honest. I'm so lost. He's the best thing that ever happened to me. I've never uh, seen him like this before. Is this the end? He refuses to even return my calls or texts. So I use that. Well, it looks like your sexual past matters, sweetheart. Yeah, suddenly it matters, right? Mm -hmm. And what I think is funny about this, hey, John, how are you doing? Um, hey, guys, copy, um, Rolo, copy, pull me out. I'm just going to switch because I'm getting some wind back here. I'm going to switch okay. to my um, laptop and go upstairs. Right. We'll, we'll, get to, we'll get to talk to John here in a second. All righty. Hello, Rolo. Hey, what's up, man? Did you catch any of that? Oh, man, I'm cringing all the way over here in Tokyo. <laughs> <laughs> I just went like this because Rich was on. But <laughs> it's well, funny. Yeah. It, 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 once we had that, once we get the quarantine, like everybody has all this free time so that you can all come on my show and I can go on your yeah. show. We can all go on everybody's show. <laughs> I know. Uh, so I was I, I wanted to, to bring that that to light here because this is a modern version of the essay that I wrote six years ago. It's almost identical to the one that I wrote, which was called Saving the Best. You can find that in the description down there if you want to read it. But what I thought was funny is when I was writing the Saving the Best post at the time, I had a lot of guys or a lot of guys and women at the same time were saying, well, that's a rarity. That's just you're, you're focusing something that's not that's not all that common. I'm like, no, that's actually very common. And I couldn't really put my finger on it at that time. I, did, I didn't have enough, uh, you know, I guess, hard evidence from other guys because I was it was sort of like guys emailing me or I was talking to them in forums and stuff. But over the course of the last six, maybe seven years, uh, it's been a pretty common occurrence. And I think right now, one of the reasons why this topic is coming up right now is because of the coronavirus, because women realize, and I, I got into a, a big Twitter debate, and I talked about this with, uh, with Donovan uh, on Friday. I got in a big Twitter debate about how and I, the, the post was this. I'll just, I'll just tell you what, the, just sort of paraphrase the post here. I said, in, going forward in the future, women will not be able to get away from their sexual past. They will not because they'll have a digital footprint, whether yeah. it's Instagram okay. or it's like even even when I was writing, um, even when I was writing Saving the Best back in, uh, in I, th I'm, I think it was 2014, even when I was writing that post, there was still evidence. I mean, it doesn't necessarily have to be like, Inst we didn't even have Instagram then. We didn't have like oh, Facebook yeah. back then, you know, 2009, whatever. We didn't have it then, but now we have such a, a, a a facility, I guess, to go back and say, who are the, are, like the guy was saying, are you still friends with those guys that you did the gangbang with in college on Facebook? And her answer is yes. <laughs> and so it is more common. And I think one of the reasons why we're seeing this right now is because women, the, the pressure is on. The pressure is on because now they can't get away from that and they want to get away from it more than ever right now. I think they're going to come to, there's going to get to a point when you can like run cheating software <laughs> and like be like, I don't think, you know, because you could do it now. Did, mm -hmm. uh, did you ever hear the story of like, of how I caught my, I was doing, I mean, I was cheating on her too, but I was mm -hmm. doing this long distance relationship with this girl in Hawaii and how I caught her cheating on me. Mm -hmm. No, no. So, no. Tell me about it. So did, that, did so, you, did you tell us, I don't know, did you, I think maybe you said this on rule zero, but go ahead. Well, so basically what happened was, um, when I, I had 
went out to visit her in Hawaii because right? we were both in Japan. Then she moved to Hawaii, and then I visited her in Hawaii, and then I ended up moving to Hawaii to be with her. But in that interim time, I just went to um, visit her in the summer, right? This was the summer of 2013, and she just gotten a brand new MacBook, and it was all in English. So she was like, hey, can you teach me how to like set up you know, iTunes and set up all my software? So I was like, yeah, no problem. So I, I set up, find my iPhone, and I set up, um, find my MacBook, right? And it syncs the devices, and you can track them on GPS 24-7. So mm. when I went back to Japan, sometimes I would just check, find my iPhone, and just see what she was up to. Like, let's let's see where she is on the GPS, right? Mm. And one day, she was um, not answering my phones, and she said she was walking home from work. So she worked, she lived in Waikiki, so... You know, Waikiki is extremely small. Yeah. And um, so it takes her about seven or eight minutes to walk from the shop, which is like right by the Hard Rock to her house, right? Uh -huh. <laughs> which is by the Alawai Canal. Uh -huh. And then I saw her deviating from her normal path, and she was like walking up on the Alawai Canal. Mm -hmm. And I kept on texting her. I was like, hey, where are you? Where are you? Where are you? Wasn't answering them. So then I started FaceTiming her. And I was like, where the hell are you? Where the hell are you? Where the hell are you? She's like, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm, she didn't reply. 30 minutes later, she answers the phone, but before she answers FaceTime, she changed her shirt. She dipped her head in the <laughs> shower. Her hair was wet and she uh -huh. had a towel around her neck and she was acting like she was drying her hair. She was like, oh, hey, I was in the shower. What are you calling me so much for? Are you okay? <laughs> and I, I, and I was like, I was, you know, I was a pimp and everything at the time. But mm -hmm. I wasn't really like turbo, like gangster, like I am now. And that was like a, a real, real eye opener in the sense of like, I, I had never really had my, you know, red pill suspicions confirmed. Mm -hmm. And it was like hardcore confirmed. And I just kept on drilling her. I was like, you're lying to me. You're lying to me. And she got to the point, she's like, how do you know that I'm lying to you? And I was like, aha. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I was tracking your iPhone using the software and the GPS. And she was like, she started crying. And then she was like, well, I was walking around with Max's boyfriend, but we were just walking. And then she was like, how dare you invade my privacy? And then she hung up the phone and got angry at me. Mm -hmm. But it was kind of petty of me, but I was so angry. I, I remotely deleted her phone and <laughs> laptop. You can completely wipe everything if you have the find my iPhone software. So I got, I got one over on her. <laughs> <laughs> but did you uh, okay so when you did that just let me I, i'm gonna ask you this because I, a lot of guys will say this too like they they'll ask me they'll say rollo i think my girlfriend wife whatever is cheating on me is it a, should i snoop on her phone right yes. did you have did yes. you have uh, okay okay but prior to that did mm -hmm. you have some suspicion that she was cheating on me. Actually, at this point, so at this point I was 27 years old, and mm -hmm. I said to myself, I have a nagging suspicion that something's up. Mm -hmm. I said, I'm gonna do this unethical thing just to confirm if my gut feeling is correct or not. Mm -hmm. And then it was confirmed, and I was like, from that point forward, I spied on every girlfriend. I check emails, I check phones, <laughs> I check Facebooks. I don't care, I have no shame, because if I'm gonna be getting to the point where if I'm gonna marry her or take have a child with her mm -hmm. i'm entitled to know everything if i'm going to be financially liable legally liable Emotionally parentally invested. liable yes you know yeah so especially that, if you're philosophy. going to abandon your sexual strategy of unlimited yeah. access to unlimited yeah. women mm -hmm. i believe you have the right and should be doing that if you're going to entertain an ltr on an exclusive basis mm -hmm. yeah I, I i agree as well now Prior to me being Rolo Tomas and you doing it, I probably would have would have said, "Well, God, that sounds really insecure of you." And that is the feminine imperative right there that tries to shame guys for being suspicious, for wanting to make guard. And this gets to sort of today's topic a little bit: is that there are certain instinctual things that we as men experience. One of those, of course, is like revulsion. Right? We don't want to get with Tess Holiday. We don't want to get with, um, you know, that that's a that's revolting to for, to most guys to get with a woman that is that morbidly crazy obese. Okay, that's a a revulsion response. Another response that men have is the hesitancy to get with a woman. Oh, Ryan, wow, it's buggy today. Um, <laughs> Look at this; it's like a mini rule zero. I know mini rule zero today. See you guys. Oh man, oh man, this is great. Now we got a party. 
I got a uh, screen share for you, Rolo, when you're ready to throw it up. Sure, sure. I will, I'll, I'll, I will in just a second. Just let me okay. finish this thought. The thought is this, is that um, there are certain instinctual things that are that come up in our periphery. And what I mean by that is like when – the reason I ask John is, is this, this is a common question I ask guys when they say, I think my girlfriend's cheating on me. And usually – that means that there's some something instinctual, something on their gut level. Like you, you know, guys tell you you got to listen to your gut, listen to your instincts. Nine times out of ten, those social uh, social conventions that benefit women, that benefit the sort of gynocentric social order, who benefit the feminine imperative, are all programmed or all social behavior sets or all the at least the, the the latent purpose of those social conventions is to get a guy to not listen to his instincts, to say, hey, I'm not really cheating on you. How dare you accuse me of that? You, you think that little of me, right? And the same thing with, with a notch count. How dare you ask me about the guys that I've had sex with in my past? Why would that make any difference? I'm me now. I'm not that person anymore. It is very important. It's, it's super important because for men, Knowing a woman's sexual past is an indication for her value as far as parental investment goes for that guy. That's a natural instinct. You want to know, to ascertain, to with 100% certainty, how, how well she would be with uh, cuckolding you or what your certainty of paternity would be with that person. And that's and even women will fight and call other women sluts, or they'll they'll fight uh, intrasexually with other women based on that idea, which is that girl is not a good bet for your paternity. She's a slut, and that's why when we say when we talk about slut shaming, it is women who slut shame other women way way more than any guy ever would, because it's a form of intrasexual combat. Well, why is it effective? Because one woman says that that other woman right there to as many women, as many men as will listen says that woman's a slut. Okay, well, why does that make her bad? Well, it makes her bad a bad bet for your own paternity, and that's why sexual past matters. What's going on, Ryan? <laughs> what am I making noise or? No, no, no. I just wanted I did bring you in and and, and give you. So, uh, what were you gonna say, uh, Rich? Yeah, I got a screen share that's kind of relevant to the topic. You probably touched on this a little bit earlier on, but I might as well show you what I was um, posting earlier this week. So that's just a that's just one of the uh, tags from the red flag chapter that I put out. There's 20 in there. Red flag number 11 is sluts. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to switch over. Can you guys still see my screen? Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. yeah. Okay. I, I got it right now. It's it's on full screen right now. Okay, yeah, because I'm doing this on a laptop, so I just had to switch tabs. So uh -huh. this woman here, uh, Lynn Man Hilgard, um, well. The summary to it is uh, slutty women can't form healthy attachments, report more depression, and often have personality disorders. This is factual. If you want to get all the details, uh, links in the bio on that chapter. But this woman here responds, I know it's just a study, but the number does matter for women as well. I think she's trying to say it doesn't matter. I know if I was single, I would never be with a F boy. Uh, but I think you need to be realistic for a woman to be with two or less and be in the middle of her life. I know it really, and then she goes on to like okay. rationalize back and forth with these guys, which often happens whenever you put these posts in here. It's like, mm -hmm. well, it, if it, if it, uh, you know, if it matters for women, then it has to matter for men too. It's like they try to apply mm -hmm. whatever sound bites and set of rules oh, yeah. seem to work for them best anyway. Does she have all the symptoms of uh, the woke patrol on her profile? Oh yeah, I don't know. That you know, French typical... spelling of the thing. I'm thinking she has yeah, at the tail end of I wasted my 20s and now is looking to justify it. No, That's no, she's guess. a she's a married Karen. Um, you know, she hasn't <laughs> taken the kids yet. She's a married Karen. I was gonna I was gonna say is that that and this is actually in my show notes here today is the uh, the presence of like this blank slate understanding. Like when I went on with Donovan and he was, I, I really wish I had a, a link to the video. He was sort of uh, doing a breakdown of, but the first thing out of this girl's mouth was how come there's such a double standard? How come guys are, and it's that standard feminist pablum, which is like, if guys can, guys can have sex with a hundred girls and they're heroes. But if I have sex with more than like three or four guys, then I'm a slut. How come that is? That's a horrible double standard for me. Wah. Yeah. And what the problem with that is, is it presumes blank slate equalism. It presumes, and this is so common. Like I, I get this from, from blue pill guys. I get this from red pill guys. I get this from, from certainly from women. Yeah, because what's oh. good for the goose is not always good for the gander because men and women are 
different. We have yeah. different mating strategies. We have different priorities. We have different goals. Our mating strategies are adversarial up to the point where we get together and become complements of one another. So yeah, it, yeah, a guy who has who has sexual prowess, a guy who can get with a hundred women. Yes, he has value because that means a hundred other women wanted to get with him, wanted to lock him down, wanted to be with him. For a woman, her mating strategy is different. She's supposed to be looking for quality, not quantity. And if she has more, if she has more quantity, what that says about her is she is a bad bet for your own paternity. That the kids that you have with her might not be yours because in her sexual past, she has proven that she is not a good bet for that because she will, you know, maybe the kids that you like go get the DNA test because if you don't get the DNA test, you can't be 100% for sure about that. And again, why are we having this conversation now? Because we now have access to uh, a woman on, on your YouTube stream, a, a woman in, in, uh, on Reddit, a woman on Twitter. What do you, what, what, John, what are you laughing at? Girls oh, on just, Reddit. I'm just, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm laughing at my girlfriend. She's oh. playing video games. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so there's that there's always going to be that blank slate equalism right there and i think the problem is and, and this this i've railed on this for a long time is that uh you're never going to get away from the what's good for the goose is good for the gander that women love the idea that women think that they own the word double standard when in fact there's actually a, a lot more double standards for men than there ever will be for women i have a as you might guess, I have an essay that's written about double standards, but that's the one that they love the most. Well, you know, did, you, um, did you cover the relevancy of the age at which women lose their virginity and their notch count? No, no, I haven't. What, what do you? 13. Um, 13 to 15. Uh, yeah. Okay, well, here, I'll, I'll, I'll just read off a couple of par paragraphs from this chapter. So, uh, for example, a woman that lost her virginity. Hang on a sec. Uh, I have to go to one other page. Uh, do, 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 do. Setting aside Harper, okay, so uh, results in her being far less uh, likely to monogamously bond to a man in a healthy way over a long period of time. For example, a woman that lost her virginity at 14 and slept with 30 men is far less likely to monogamously bond to you over the long term compared to a woman who lost her virginity at 23 and only slept with two men in long-term relationships. Mm -hmm. um, it's relevant because uh, research conducted by the Institute for Family Studies revealed that a virgin has a 5% chance of divorce after five years, whereas a woman uh, with two previous partners has a 30% chance of divorce. And the data stopped at 10 partners, which indicated 35% chance, but it just kept getting worse. Mm -hmm. So the more uh, guys that she slept with, the less likely she is to form a healthy long-term pair bond with a man. Um, they didn't really get into specific details why. I mean, we could speculate and probably suggest that it's just easier for her to bounce from one guy to the next, right? My, uh, my observation on this has always been the same. But when I talk about um, alpha widows, um, this is what I mean, is it's not so much a numbers game for women as it is an alpha impact. Now, numbers do play a part in that because the more... The more partners that a woman has, the more likely it is that she's bonded or she has been, uh, she's, I, I guess. That one of them was better than you, essentially. That one was better there. One of those guys was the alpha that she's going to be widowed from. This goes back to what I was saying before you guys came on was, uh, I understand why premarital sex is taboo for a lot of religions. The reason for that is because it limits that woman's ability to bond with guys who are not her husband. So if a, if a woman is a virgin bride and the guy is a virgin bride, that makes sense because he's going to hopefully be the, the, the first best guy who satisfies that, you know, is he the best dude that I can do? And she's only ever had sex with that one guy. She has nothing else to compare that guy to. And in our past, that made sense. I don't know that it makes a, a lot of sense these days, but it made sense back then enough to make premarital sex like fornication was a big deal. It's a big deal for a lot of religions. Same thing applies to like prearranged marriages, right? It's it's like uh, women will always say that they're, they're appalled at the idea of a prearranged marriage. But what is the what is the latent purpose of a, a prearranged marriage? To avoid those things, to avoid the worst aspects of women's hypergamy, and to avoid the worst aspects of men's, you know, unlimited access to unlimited sexuality. So I understand those things. I'm not saying that they have any real. Uh, I mean, maybe they do, maybe they don't. I think still think that's up for, up for debate, but I think in this modern time that maybe those are a little bit more antiquated than they, you know, realistically, they're more antiquated. It'd be, it'd be nice if we could all do that, but nobody, human nature oh, is, yeah. is, is- The cat's uh, out of the bag. Pandora's pox is open. You're 100% right. It's like, here's the problem now. 
knowing all this stuff, and I love how you give it as like, this is how we're kind of wired. The mm -hmm. problem I have, and here's going to be my anti MGTOW rant, is they, <laughs> they just cry that it's not going to go back to that. And they're waiting for some kind of, I don't know, crazy pandemic to make it happen. Mm -hmm. Dude, the question so you got to ask yourself, yeah, is like, well, what do you do now? Now that the cat's out of the bag, now that you're not going to get some virginal 15 year old bride and, you know, turn butter all day, what do you do with that? Mm -hmm. Well, they're not going to pair bond. So obviously that's why marriage is kind of out of the equation now. Try not to get married because basically what did uh, Dalrock said that one where it was, um, I refuse to give a proper wedding to a girl who can't offer herself as a proper bride, something like that. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think that was yeah. Dalrock. So that's that's right. the yeah, it's the nature of the game. If a girl's going to have, you know, no, I'm in no diamond for you. Yeah, right. then that's fine. I'm just not going to give you the pristine wedding and you're sure as hell not going to wear white to it. Yeah. It's it's not it's not a sour grapes thing either. It's just like we don't leech either because we know it just doesn't work. Same with mm -hmm. marriage. Same with all this stuff. Yeah, and so and I the, think yeah, that's the problem is that a lot of people hear it, and I think this is why you get a lot of grief about being angry because yeah. you're essentially just explaining our evolutionary psychological past. But people mm -hmm. are saying that you are doing what the MGTOWs do and just complain that it's not that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I again, it's it goes back to what I was talking about about shaming on on Wednesday's show. And and yes, uh, you can be shamed by a man or by a woman for the same kind of the same kinds of things, right? Yeah. So when uh, if you've got like a sort of a blue pill alpha guy, he's going to pile on that same social convention that says uh, or tells guys that they should be ashamed of themselves for even asking those questions. So they should they should just accept the nature of that woman, or they would say that don't you think that women are just as sexual as men are? How dare you not? You know, <laughs> How dare you turn those thoughts into the IRS like that? Yeah. <laughs> not mentioning any names specifically. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So there's there's one thing, and women are going to watch this. And I'm, I I don't know how many women are actually watching this live with us right now, but women are going to say this. They're going to say, "Well, those guys in the red pill, they they're conflicted. They all want to spin plates and have sex with as many women as they possibly can, but yet they get angry because uh, they can't find a virgin bride." Or they can't find a woman with a very low notch count with whom to you know live happily ever after with 2.5 kids and a dog in the yard. And so, like, what would you say to to Karen who's gonna who's gonna bring that one up? What's the difference between a woman that you want to keep and a woman that you want to bang? We'll pretty much bang anything, yeah. but when it comes to keeping a girl, like. I don't want to keep a girl that's been ran through. I just feel it in my stomach. And I know other guys do too. It's just society is literally trying to shame us into their agenda. Like I tried to force myself to date a girl that had been with like 50 dudes and I just couldn't do it. I was just like, every time I looked at her, I was just like, ugh. And then I knew one of the dudes that, that used to, that slept with her one time. And then one time I watched them to interact and I was like, man, I'm out. I'm not doing this. But that's just it. The problem like everybody keeps looking at the symptom, like the problem. It's not so much the notch count. It's that you saw, for example, there, you saw clearly that the other guy has a chance to slide in those DMs if he's given half the chance. And it's like, I don't want to deal with that hassle. If I'm not getting your best, if I'm not getting 100% of you, I no. Yeah, that's a, and that's that gets to what I was talking about at the beginning here when I was writing that that post, uh, saving the best. A lot of guys believe that they should be the guy that is their best, the guy that represents the the best dude that she can get with. And if she didn't, then she shouldn't have been marrying that guy in the first place. I think what's ironic about this is if you go and you listen to these guys who are like the uh, you know, the, the very moral absolutist trad cons, they will say, Well, if that's the case, then you married the wrong girl, right? You married a girl who had a partner count of four. How dare you? You should have found a virgin bride. That would have been better. And that goes to this one right here. And, and I'm just going to put this up here real quick. GM says, accurately define modern women's value, please. This is a common thing from MGTOWs, which is women are just worthless. Why would you even want to have anything to do with women? Because they are never going to be faithful to you. They've been run through by, you know, 10 different, most of them have been run through by 10 different guys. And that, that there's no point because they'll never be able to bond with you, much less when they do bond with you, still want to stick with you because they have, they're valueless. So I always say this all the time. And I, I wrote a post about what, three months ago, four months ago, and it was a post for women. And it was sort of like advice for like, Women, if this is, you know, if you honestly want to find a guy in the long term, you might want to consider things. It's not a program. It's just have you considered these suggestions? And I've said this in the past. I've said that it, when women make themselves just sexual objects, don't don't be surprised when men simply objectify you. And there is uh, an ideal, I think, behind all this where it's uh, 
Uh, it's about the, well, the what I call value added. I think it's you know, it's a sales term, right? Like, what else do you provide beyond just the sexual? Like, do you will you do things for the express pleasure of a, of a man? Will you put off the feminine imperative? Will you put off your feminist training? and you know want to get with a guy who's a high value guy okay great what will you do beyond the sexual to to you know to make that relationship work you got um what was it? i think it was uh, patrice o'neill uh he had that part of his comedy bit where he asks the ladies if you didn't have a uh, a vagina uh how would you know what would you do to please your man and of course every woman in the audience says oh i'd give him anal or i'd i'd, I'd you mm -hmm. know oral or whatever and then he says you see what you did just did right there he says you just basically reduced yourself to a series of holes yep. that's all and and you just killed the humor out of that I'm sorry <laughs> I, I, I know I, everybody, ah. always says, everybody says well roll he's just lifting patrice o'neill i didn't even know who patrice o'neill was until like he was long gone but uh i i, I definitely appreciate patrice o'neill i did, thought he was a really funny guy but the humor comes from it's funny because it's true right it's funny because we recognize the the irony in that in in his humor um is there any point in trying to identify notch count is there any reliable way to identify notch count to filter out these nope sluts dude they're I all mean, gonna you lie. could get Every a ball you one. could get a ballpark air you could get a ballpark but you'll never like pinpoint it down here's Here's what I figured out. Women will talk about their LTRs, but the one night stands, the threesomes, the gang bangs, the, you know, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas that weekend in Ibiza. Those never end up in the number, right? Mm -hmm. So you can reliably triple or quadruple whatever number they'll end up giving you. Funny you should say that. That's what the girl on Donovan show was saying. It was like, you know, if, uh, if a girl's telling you one thing, you could probably add three to that mm -hmm. number and you probably get a more accurate number for guys like subtract three and you'll yeah. probably get the accurate number. <laughs> you probably yeah, guys yeah, usually over-exaggerate women try to preserve, right? I wouldn't mm -hmm. even waste my time asking. Just assume it's twice yours and then you can deal with what's in front of you instead I'm of looking at some that up. magical I'm signal. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because that's what I was going to say is that uh, I've always said this is this is one of my iron rules, which is like never reveal the amount, uh, your your actual notch count as a guy. There's no point in doing that. And first of all, it, it, second of all, it's because w women are, when they're asking you those things, it's usually because they want to save that up. So the next time you guys get into a fight that, that yep. you know, pretty much jealous, like crazy ass women will ask you that. But the, uh, the flip side of that is as a guy, never ask her what her notch count is because you don't need to. You can figure it out on yourself, yourself. And if you right. lack the imagination and if you lack the game and you lack the subtlety to figure out how many guys that, that, that this person has been with in her sexual past, you need to learn to read. You need to understand what, you know, the medium is the message. And at some point she'll tell you, you might, might not be verbally, or you'll find out through like your soon to be brother-in-law, you know, or, or some, somewhere along the line, you will, you'll, you'll know, you will know just how, like, especially like, what was it? Uh, I had a, uh, I have a post called, um, what is it? Uh, the slut paradox is what it was. And I built this post off of this uh, bit that Andrew Dice Clay used to do. And what he used to do is he'd be in a, a in the audience and he'd, he'd see some like a couple there and he sees some like good looking girl with a guy and goes, ah, oh, your, your girlfriend looks pretty good. And he'd be, the guy's like, yeah, yeah. He's like, He's like, how long you guys been together? Uh, you know, six months, eight months. Oh yeah, great, great. He's like, does she suck a good dick? And and he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he's all, I suppose the next question is, how do you think she got that way? <laughs> you know, and, and it, to me, like I was, I, I laughed. Of course, we laughed at it, but I was like, like that's that's kind of like something that guys just don't really, they don't want to know. They just think that she's just got some natural talent for it, and it's like, no, she had to figure that out at some point. That's how you find out how many guys she's been with. And I was going to say with, with Rich, like uh, when you're uh, when you're talking about like, how do you know, uh, like a, if a girl's a virgin or or like I, I've always advised guys not to even get with virgins, because usually what happens is if you get with a virgin, that girl's going to bond with you. She's going to like you're going to be her first. You know, they say you never forget your first. I, I have had sex with two virgins in my life. And each one of them was, it was fun when I was doing it, but afterwards it was like, wow, you, you get the phone calls and the, you know, the, the attachment that went along with that was crazy. And I think that, that that's one of the reasons why I tell guys, I said, unless you know what you're getting into, unless that's your like religious thing or whatever, yep. 
you know, try to avoid that kind of and stuff. And it can quickly turn into resentment once they find out you uh, you played them, and then they go down the... Especially you know, if you've the, the brothers that are Italian or something, they want to kill you. Yeah. They go down uh, the East, Indians, of, East they, Indians were bad for that, too. They go down the path of eternal horror after that one, too. <laughs> yeah. I, got, this, I knew this was going to come up, and actually this is in my notes, so I'll just read it here. So, uh, Black Sheep says, do guys hold any responsibility for female not count? If most people are holding one night or having one night stands, this was, of course, it's funny. I, I don't know if this is a guy or not. Probably it is a guy, but this is the, again, this is the blank slate equalist, uh, you know, question. But so do guys hold any responsibility for a woman's match? No. I mean, you nope. wanted your equality. You got it. And this is what you've done with it. You've become literally the fattest people on planet Earth. <laughs> I mean, you know, hey. We're oh, still going to bite him in the ass here soon. <laughs> you know, you're not they, responsible they're... for anybody else's choices or life. Mm -hmm. Plain and simple. Yeah. Well, I, I get a, uh, I get this, and I think Ryan, you were listening to this. Uh, I, that I forget the guy. It's the guy who's the very moral absolutist guy that we've been talking to in in on Twitter recently. Um, oh, uh, Pat name. Stedman 2.0 there. Yeah, 2.0. Yeah, that guy. I oh, honestly, I muted him honestly, quick. I'm like, I'm done with this dork. Honest to God, that guy is very. I thought it was a bot. I thought it was a bot that was sort of like a trad bot. <laughs> I don't know because it's the same. It's the same thing over and over and over again. But one of the things, of course, that. Uh, traditional conservatives will say as well, you know, or or even women will say this. They'll say, "Well, m women would be better if men didn't create a demand for this. Like, you wouldn't, we wouldn't have uh, OnlyFans. We wouldn't have the lack of agency now that it suits yeah. them. Yeah, you know, yeah. you got the vote. That bridge has sailed. I don't even listen. Yeah, I, I, I don't. Either. But like, what do you what do you say to those guys though? Like, you how laugh at them? You laugh at them because they're ridiculous and they deserve what they're going to get. Yeah, That's all you yeah. can do. Mm -hmm. I, I have a, I got, again, I've got an essay where I, I covered this, but it's called uh, Our Sister's Keeper. Are we our sister's keeper? And once women got to the point where they've emancipated themselves from men's, like they're independent from men. So how responsible are they for their own actions? Now, you got you got moral absolutist guys who will say, well, uh, you know, men need to be, if men were better men, then women would be better women. And if you, you, you get what you, uh, you tolerate. And I think that's kind of sort of, I think that's a cop out or a cope, I guess, because what, what happens is, is when a guy talks about how his, like, for instance, this, this guy who's fiance, we turns out that she's still talking to these guys on Facebook that she had a gang bang with when she was in her wild and crazy party years in college. Uh, all that guy has to do is say, well, you chose the wrong woman. You you weren't wise enough to figure out that she was actually a whore. And I, you know, at, at, at some at some point, maybe the guy's got a point because right now women are not going to be able to get away from that sexual past. They're not going to be able to get away from that digital footprint anymore. And so when I, the reason I brought that up or I even threw that out there as a post was because I'm seeing all these only fan things. And weren't, <laughs> we, weren't we talking about like iDubs on, on Saturday? Yeah, I can't and believe I had to teach you who he was. Or I, know who he was. I, I know who PewDiePie is, but I didn't know I didn't know who iDubs uh, was. Uh, iDubs well, is like a know. lower level pleb on the internet. <laughs> oh, <really? laughs> yeah, so he's, the he's amount name. of new signups for OnlyFans is something like quadrupled in the last month. Mm-hmm. Is that signups mm -hmm. or is of, of girls signing up or like of them or is that girl, revenue? Girl, yeah, like actual girl up. creators, like you know, people with their only fans sort of uh groups. So I you know, know there's, there's, yeah, I can confirm that for sure. There's some there's some biblical level of simping going out there on every level <laughs> now. It's like these only fans pages are just ridiculous, man. You see these uh, like the one that I posted the other day on Twitter, there's a 68 year old woman making yeah. eighteen thousand dollars plus US dollars wow. a month. Off of George Bruno. Off of George <laughs> Bruno's following. Because <laughs> <laughs> that's when they peak, right? That's when they peak. <laughs> oh, <laughs> poor George. George. When I saw that, but <laughs> that's, it, that's the level of, you know, I, I, I know I was joking about this, but like the guys like, uh, like Tristan Tate and Andrew Tate, like only fans is their competition now. Yeah, like, like they, be. women are just going to cut out the middlemen. Why would they go and and go to a, a cam horse site with you know their cam horse site when they've got only fans and they can go you know they're f what uh, free agents? They're free agent. <laughs> I know that the signups are up, but are is the revenue up? Do these girls have followers? That's the problem. They're never going to. I know that they're resorting if to whoredom. I'm seeing it on the eight year old making eighteen grand U.S. dollars a month. I'm sure that even like a a five that's twenty two can do it. 
Imagine I'm, a five out of 10 thought who can't make money on porn. Like how useless do you have to be when you can't even sell it? Yeah. <laughs> I know there's at least a few of those ones out there. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, again, I, I put that, I didn't realize it was going to go viral or it was going to be such a big impact. But when I put that one tweet out there, just saying, Hey, look, you know, we're getting to a point right now where women won't be able to escape their sexual past. Women lost their shit. <laughs> and why? Because you, in, right, this, true, that's why. in this, in this particularly post virus world right now where women are signing up to become, you know, ass models or whatever on only fans right now um and and making a lot of money a 68 year old woman can make you know 18 grand a month off of something like this um you know why wouldn't they but what's the cost and what's that going to say well oh there's a there's a caveat to her so she okay. apparently has a 45 year old disabled yes. son yeah. and then she's doing the pity party yeah. I found her GoFundMe yeah, and for my son. Yeah. yeah. Hey, who wants to fap guiltily like that? That's well, that's too well, somebody, <laughs> well, somebody grabbed a a a video clip of her and posted it to the replies of that post. I don't know if mm -hmm. you can find that, John, but there's a video clip of her saying, I'm available between eleven and twelve on Wednesday if you want to come bang me. Um, you know, she's not talking about her son being around or anything like that, but like you see this like movement in the background in the other room. Some, oh no! Some some forty year old guy doing something, it's hobbling around on his hobbling own leg. around. Yes, I don't know. Something. It's just it's just that kid's gonna rent a van when he gets oh, older. Oh man, the level it. of thoughtery is is just. I got a I got a photo if you want to see it, Rollo. Oh, <laughs> Put it on. Why not? It's pretty PG. It's not bad. Right. If I was hammered, I'd do it. Oh, <laughs> that's an awful, awful yeah, well, that's the point with all this. <laughs> there she is. Oh, at least she's jacked. I mean, the, in the gun department. Yeah. Well, Look at those udders. What, would you do it if she smelled like mothballs? <laughs> <laughs> like like fine tanned leather. I'm not hit it. <laughs> roll it not going to hit that. But yeah, roll, that's the problem. I, oh, it's not a problem, but it's something that you notice. A lot of guys love to emote about this. Like the game is out. Everybody knows the game and every guy loves to argue with girls about this, but they're going to lie about it. They're going to try and shame you. Words are absolutely irrelevant at this point. The only thing that matters is what a guy does with that information. Right. And the less judgmental you are to the exterior, like the less people see you as judgmental, the more honest they're going to be. And mm -hmm. the better information you're going to have to make these decisions. That's a good point. Yeah. Because yeah, there's a strategy I had when I was dating it was awesome. I would just get drunk with a girl, have like a, a nice beta male night in. We get drunk and I confess some something stupid. Something stupid that I did. And then the girl, because they always like to play along, will gladly confess some stupid stuff that they did. Oh, yeah. She wants you, to beat you, right? Yeah. Park that thing in the back of your mind. And then when you sober up the next day, make yourself an omelet and think, yeah, no. Yeah. <laughs> no. Yeah. Oh, this is a good, this is actually a pretty good one. I don't want to be Eskimo Brothers with that guy. I got to go. Eskimo Brothers, too. Um, let's see. Oh, James says this. What happens when facial recognition becomes mainstream? A dude can then vet by running her image through internet and see where she pops up. Yeah, we did you can see already, the reaction to that makeup? You, know, about this. <laughs> you could already do that. Like on some, there's like a makeshift way you can do that now. You can kind of like run her uh, photo through a finder and then see like all her traces on social media and do detective work. You know, a little bit, little bit of elbow grease, but you can do it. I think well, Rich, uh, Rich and I were joking about that one time. We were like, we should we should start a service. We'd probably make a lot of money at it. Where like, if a guy meets a girl at a club, or she he meets her somewhere else, and then he you know maybe he's got a subscription or something. He sends a picture, and we go and we do the the quick background yeah. check on her. Like, show me well, show me the ho facts. Just look at yeah, ho facts. <laughs> that's, what, that's what you call it, huh? Ho facts. Well, Rolo, do you remember the reaction when they had that makeup removal app? Like, yeah. I have a feeling that. 150 million Karens are going to scream, and then there's no way in hell that that doesn't get kiboshed right away. Oh, is yeah. there any like, is there any biological repercussions that happen to a woman that you can actually like biological markers that you can test? Like, okay, you, you know, like a swab oh, out of her oh, mouth. About that fruit fly study now, where they like apparently they keep some of the DNA just in case. Somewhere yeah, in yeah, yeah. Is that is that feasible down the road, like 50 years? Dude, the kind well, of guy who's going to get cucked doesn't have the balls to ask. Well, I was going to say, man, if you're like you know, getting into it. It's like throwing a hot dog down a hallway. You can pretty much be sure she's been with a lot of dudes. And one, mm -hmm. one thing I wanted to also, this is, I'm looking at my show notes here. One, the other thing I wanted to, to mention here is that, um, it, first of all, it should be important to a guy about a woman's, you know, sexual past. Uh, that should be a factor, 
Like, yeah. depending on who you are as a guy, again, I'm not going to give you a prescription. Maybe it's more important to you. Maybe it's less important to you. You don't need to ask. You can find out through lots of different different means and everything. Um, but what was I going to say here? It's uh, let's see. Oh, I remember. Of course, we we've always said this. This is a, a common maxim, I guess, in the manosphere, which is it was never yours. It was just your turn, right? Mm -hmm versus long-term investment. So I think a lot of guys, particularly guys who have been married for a long time, want to think that that is like really nihilistic or that they've got some kind of special relationship with their wife or whatever and that that would never happen to them. I, 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 even, I heard those words come out of the mouth of Dr. Everett Piper one time. I just know. I just know she would never do something like that. Yeah. I mean, My anyway. health will never catch fire. I don't need fire insurance. Yeah. Or maybe, he, <laughs> you know, but I think that how you use that information, just like what you were saying here a minute ago, Ryan, how you use that is you should keep that under your hat and, ha you know, use it as some, you know, something that can guide you along to make better decisions for yourself. So when people say this, well, Rolo, is it just your turn with your wife? You've been with her for like 24 years. What if she decides that she wants to go get with somebody better than you? You know, and I'm like, you're going back on tour with the band. Here's, here's the difference. I know that. I know that I know that dynamic. I understand that, you know, uh, you know, it could be just my turn is over. Right. I, I understand that most guys don't know that they think they believe in that ideal. They believe in that my quality woman. They believe in their one itis, their married one itis at that point. So, yeah, I, you know, I, I love my wife dearly. We have a great relationship. We have been. We're going to we're coming up on 24 years right now. I don't have any reason to believe that anything like that would happen. But. I know it could. Again, it's it's not every woman will, but every woman could. Have the and potential. That, yeah, mm -hmm. the potential that you have to sort of keep in the back of your head. And so when you going forward into this brave new world that we're heading into, that's very important for guys to understand. That's part of red pill awareness. Like yeah. you can you can let that be a, a point of like despondency for you. You can get depressed over that, or you can use that and keep it under your hat and say, well, you know. Yeah, I got to I got to stay up on my burden of performance, of course. But like, you know, uh, the, other, the other problem is, is, uh, you know, hypergamy is not a straight jacket. She still has prerequisites and a in a burden of performance on herself if she thinks she's going to get better than the guy that she's actually with. You know, the ironic thing about all this, too, Rolo, mm -hmm. it's a very Taoist idea, like Eastern philosophy, that there's like nothing has permanence. But for mm -hmm. some reason, the same guys will talk about their chakras up their ass. <laughs> refuse to accept like one of the basic tenets of Eastern philosophy, which is mm -hmm. that she's not yours. It's just your turn. That's just, right. that's it's attachment yeah. you get attached to that. And you know, at, at some point you're going to get attached. I'm very attached to my wife. I'm sorry. That's what makes you know, a separation or a divorce or a breakup or whatever. That's what makes it very, very tough and very, you know, you, not anybody, you know, it takes a very special guy or a very, you know, detached, dissociated guy to just be like, oh, I can walk away anytime I want. We say that all the time, right? We say, you know, anything you can't walk away from makes you its slave. Well, that's a very extreme way of thinking about it. I, and I'm not saying that I don't I disagree with that, but I'm just saying that using that as sort of like how to plan your future is I don't think that's a way to plan your future. You still have to make decisions. You still have to like even in a was it 48 laws of power? Where um, I forget the number of the of the law, but uh, Robert Greene says never commit to anything. I think it was number twenty, if I'm not uh, not mistaken. But never commit to anything. And then, of course, at the end of all of his chapters and all of his rules, there's the reversal. And the reversal of that one is that if you don't commit to something, then you seem as if you are just fickle and duplicitous, and you don't have any allegiance to anything. And you don't know what you actually believe in. So you're always kind of balancing the difference between like sort of desire versus you know what you're what you're willing to commit to and honestly most guys are ready to commit at a moment's notice because that committal the, the committing the commitment part is actually forms the basis of their game is mm -hmm. i gotta commit or else i'm not gonna get laid or i've got to commit or i'm not gonna get where i want to get with this person and that's where you know guys will make very bad uneducated decisions yeah well it's a sadness thing like i'm I want to be crying over a bowl of cereal in the morning kind of separation, not sucking on an exhaust pipe in my car separation. I think that's the difference. Yeah. I, uh, and here's the last one I got on here right now and we'll, we'll get to super chats here today, guys. Um, but, uh, the last one I got is why are, uh, 
Well, uh, let's just, I'll just start with uh, iron rule number three. Iron rule number three is this, is that any woman that makes you wait for sex, the sex is never worth the wait. Now, the common misperception of this is that I'm ex I'm expecting guys or I'm expecting women to just put out on the first date. And if you don't, then you're a waste of time for that guy. And I, not, a, not anything what I meant with that particular rule. The rule is this, is that that's the, if a woman is making you wait for sex, there is something that is mitigating that sex from happening. Because if a woman has genuine desire for you, she's going to break rules for you. She breaks rules for alphas. She makes rules for betas. Guys have a real tough time with that because they are they realize that the woman that they're with is making an awful lot of rules for them. And they don't like the idea that maybe that woman sees them as, as sort of the beta. So what do they do is they turn that around. They say, well, I don't want a loose girl. You know, I, and they use that as kind of their game. They use the idea that uh, that they're a, a unique guy because they're not just interested in loose, meaningless sex. They want to start a relationship with that person and they want to be her best friend and they want to have some sort of deeper, meaningful connection with that girl before they have sex. Well, which is bullshit because the same guy who's saying that is also addicted to porn. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, when I when I say like I had to throw that in there, I had to throw in uh, iron rule number three. Because a lot of people will ask me about that. They'll say, well, you know, or, or what do you tell your daughter? And that's one of these guys, one of these guys questions here as well. But it's that mitigation factor. Understand that when a woman wants to get wants to be physical with you, there's a sense of urgency there because hypergamy cannot afford to miss out on good opportunities. That's why they don't make rules for alphas and they make rules for betas. So uh, let's got anything else to add to that? No, no, I just think I think every guy who is who is listening to this, don't get shamed into believing you need to date any chick who has been ran through. OK, yeah. you're your don't only get judge. shamed. That's not cool at all. Like if for some dudes, like, you know, if you want to be a loser like Socrates and marry single mom, you could do that, too. <laughs> but like if 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 most guys that I know, most guys that have confidence make a little money have a little you know have a little swagger got a little something going for themselves they typically don't want a girl that's been ridden more than the village bicycle and that's okay and it doesn't matter if you're 18 it doesn't matter if you're 63 the biggest point which you know and i, I just think it just coincides with rollo says just because it just i think it's a universal truth point for men i always say do what you want to do and rollo always says be your mental point of origin mm -hmm. so if you don't like it don't accept it. Like if you went to a taco shop and I gave you a cheeseburger, if you're the kind of guy that like would shrug your shoulders and be like, eh, I guess I'll eat it. That you got to work on a little bit of your inner game. Like at the end of the day, you have to be comfortable with putting your foot down in relationships and business partnerships, because if not, you will be taken advantage of. There is no ands, ifs or buts about that. Yeah. I think that, um, well I said, a good a good place to start is to first of all understand that men and women are different we're not blank slates that's one of the i think that even guys who who consider themselves red pill aware still default to to the blank slate idea and they don't really realize just how broad the blank slate really is or the equal is what i call equalism really is and so when women start saying oh that's a that's a a double standard or oh um you know how can you yeah go? we're all equal except for I'm some not. of us are more equal than others right and i think that <laughs> that's, a, that's a good starting point but like, like, like guys will say well, okay what can, I, what can i do with this what can i do with this information that you're giving to me well understand that going forward women are going to try to convince you that you are an insecure male because you have an actual concern about a woman's sexual past not only do they say well it's rude to ask about it well the problem is is you can't escape it right now a guy goes and looks at your uh, ladies. If a guy goes and looks at your Instagram or goes and looks at your Snapchat or your OnlyFans or whatever it is that you're doing right now in your quarantine days, and you're selling your ass or your or whatever else, um, understand that that's going to stick with you. The internet doesn't forget. And maybe you were able in the past to hide a VCR tape of you having a gangbang when you were in your crazy college days, but you can't do that online now. You cannot do that with Instagram. You can't. Like, was it a was it was it Tristan or was it Andrew Tate who were saying like uh, Instagram is now the biggest dating app, like bigger than even Tinder right now? Because what's the first thing you do when you meet a new person? You go and like creep around on their socials, right? Oh yeah, like, they don't even give phone numbers anymore. Here's my Snapchat or here's my Insta. Yeah. A phone, a phone close is, means nothing anymore. It's all like, here's my Instagram. Here's who, here's who I am. Here's my online persona. 
And you're not going to be able to, to get away with that. Guys, understand that when a woman says that you're insecure for asking or why, why do guys have any concern about this? Understand that, first of all, there's the natural concern, which is you're not a good bet for my for for you're, you're a really good bet for cuckoldry, but you're not a good bet for me ensuring my own paternity. And so what's going to happen? They're going to say, well, that's insecure. You shouldn't care. Or, or a guy shouldn't care who the father actually is. And we're going to try, and we're already seeing this. I've been writing posts about this all last year about how there's a war on paternity right now. And it's a war in the sense that it is trying to devalue or de-emphasize the natural innate concern that a guy has with a woman who either is a single mother or is a bad bet for their own paternity. And that is something that we evolved as part of our innate mental firmware to be concerned about because we want to know that if we're going to give up our mating strategy, if we're going to give up our, you know, our, our direction and whatever it is, you know, again, mating strategies are adversarial. If we give that up, the, the only payoff or the only insurance that we have is that the kid's going to be ours. Now, in this, in this day and age, women are saying it shouldn't matter. It shouldn't matter. You should just marry me anyways. You should. It shouldn't matter. If you had sex with a hundred guys. You should still just marry me because I'm a I'm a high quality girl because I say so. And I, again, these was I'm just throwing these out there so I give you guys. Yeah, some no, it's oh, no. That's essentially it. And if you worship women, of course you're going to let them be the arbiters of morality and let them be your judge. Right. That's that's right. the problem with that Stedman 2.0 moron there. Mm -hmm. Everybody, he's telling everybody to worship women, and if you do worship women, they're going to pull the wool over your eyes by saying stupid stuff like this. Right. When mm -hmm. any guy with half an ounce of sense knows, she just basically asked me for five hundred thousand dollars, twenty years of commitment, and is offering me two months of uh, hot dog down a hallway duty sex. It's like right. no. Yeah. And what's Ugh. that kind of like? I and I maybe this goes back to the iDubs thing, but like you got a woman who's already involved in that, and she's already a part of that, and you're cool with that. Like you're, I, I was reading this one, uh, it was an article about this guy. I, I think he's a personal trainer in Los Angeles and his wife or his girlfriend has a, a fan, an only fans. And she just, show, I don't think she does porn, but like she shows off her body and she's pretty much a cam, like a freelance or free agent mm -hmm. cam girl. And the guy's like totally cool with that because she makes over a hundred thousand dollars a year off of that. And she's, she's probably in her mid thirties and she's Swedish and she looks pretty good. I mean, she looks all right, but Again, it's that thirst. It's guys, you know, throwing the money, you know, good money after bad uh, yeah. to her. But that's what I'm, what I'm talking about is like there's the guy that's going to be OK with that. And then there's the like we say, oh, well, he must be very secure in his masculinity that he's OK with that. Well, most guys aren't. And yeah. most guys are you better have good pimp game. That's the thing, because you can't walk back from pimp game to be in the master patriarch. You're yeah. in the pimp game for good. Like Tate with his girl. He can't walk that back and say, hey, let's stop this cam stuff and move into the woods and farm potatoes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you're not going to eat. He's not going to be Amish anytime soon. Yeah, like Idubs, he's committed right. now. So you better hope you got good pimp hand and pimp game and, strong. And Idubs is like a complete beta male just because he has fame. That guy has zero game. If you, if you, the fact that he like came out and made a defense of it, like that guy's been a dork his whole life. He was obsessed with Tana Montague and like he went and followed her and made that, you know, the N bomb video. And oh, so, that one. I remember that now. That was him because he was obsessed with her. He's a dork. That guy's never been like. Dude, for the longest time, I thought that was August Ames until the, she committed suicide. Then I'm like, oh, that's a different girl. Yeah. <laughs> if you guys don't know who that is, they're offering it for free right now on Pornhub. Go do some research. Oh, boy. <laughs> Go join the other patriarchs. <laughs> All right. I'm going to move back. I, I do have one bonus question that I think you guys are going to think is really funny. So I'm going to move backwards here in, in, in the timeline. Uh, Caleb says, dating a girl seven months, haven't said love yet. Don't be the first one to say you love her. Yeah. Um, that is a big, that's a, that's one of the, uh, I think that is the number one uh, commandment of Poon. If I do not miss my guess is never say, mm -hmm. never be the first to say that you love her. There's it's your the two thirds rule. You don't want to over invest. Let them invest more than you. It's the cardinal rule of relationships. That's yeah. like your very first thing that you had. All right. we got. Yeah. The other part of that too is if, you ever get to the conversation of the talk and where do we stand? She's, she's the one that needs to bring it up. Not you. Yeah. Okay. Yellow here. My regular guy says, hi, Rolla. What is your definition uh, reason for girl with daddy issues and why do they have high notch count? How does hypergamy work in this, in this kind of girl? What? I, well, hypergamy is uh, hypergamy works 
the same way in every girl. How yeah, it, it manifests so it's it like is, gravity. It always works. <laughs> yeah, you have to remember that you have to split the difference here because uh, hypergamy is is a sort of a subroutine that's running in the back of women's heads all the time. No, women are not more or less hypergamous. They're all hypergamous. How they are allowed to, or how they. Um, uh, how they can express that hypergamy uh, in different social contexts, according to their personalities, according to their histories, according to whatever else. Remember that hypergamy is always on. It's not. It's not something that's that's a a, qual, a, a quantitative thing. It is always. It's always in effect. So, uh, the the religious girl that you met in Bible study is just as hypergamous as the stripper that you picked up at the club. Okay? John can confirm that one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Wait. Wait. Hey, um, confirm what? I got to run, guys. Uh, My battery is almost school. dead. All right, man. Oh. Good to have you, man. I got to run. Uh, see you, see you guys. Right. I'm doing it before the trainer tomorrow night at 8 p.m. So if you're sure. around, check that out. See you guys nice. later. Bye, man. Later, Peace. buddy. Bye. All right. Yeah, John, you were full of stories of uh, girls from Sunday school Dude. and how they were worse than anything. Roll, did anything you know but I was, Catholic girls. Roll, did you know I was in school to be a pastor? I think you. I, I heard you mention that one time. <laughs> yeah. on your Sunday shows. I, that was I got thrown out. Uh, obviously, <laughs> <Really>? <laughs> right. I mean, uh, guys. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go through some of these uh, super chats here because I usually do this at the end of the show, and then I have a bonus question that I think you guys are gonna, especially uh, John, is gonna like. All right. Okay. It's so about fried rice, I got you. No, no. <laughs> yeah. Well, I know. I hold that thought. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Black Sheep says, uh, "Happy birthday! Thanks for that five bucks." Tiger the Brave says, uh, "Want to be a dad and make alpha widows, but I'm scared." Uh, well, I'm sorry what? to hear that. Um, oh, that's why really do you want to make idea. alpha widows? Why do you, you want to? Yeah. Well, uh, you know what's funny is I, I, we get this all the time, particularly from like uh, moral absolutist guys. Uh, is well, you guys shouldn't be players because it's the players that are ruining the girls for us. Yeah, that's the you, statement line. Girl, if you wouldn't, if you wouldn't have been a, a player, then my girl wouldn't be an alpha male or an alpha widow right now. And it's like, well, again, agency, responsibility. Am I your? Am I my sister's keeper? And in this day and age, no, I'm not. Sorry, uh, you know, there has to be at least some burden of responsibility on women right now if they have independence from men. And do you remember that post where the guy put if more girls dress or if guys were more chivalrous, girls would dress nice? And he put that girl dressed up as yeah, like 1950s. Yeah. She street. looked like uh, Breakfast at Tiffany's, man. And she then she good. told him, like, go uh, pound sand, don't tell me what to do. And I was yeah. like, that's exactly what's happening here. Uh, it's your yeah. guys' fault that I can't hold this thing down. And the girl hears Just that like and Audrey says, Hepburn. Yeah. She's basically treating her like a sex doll. Yeah. If you guys would stop breaking my sex doll, she'd be exactly what I needed. Of course, girls are going to be offended by that. Mm. Why are, uh, why are the evil misogynists the only ones that treat girls like human beings? That's what yeah. I want to know. Yeah. Here's my or, question to you. Or treating them. I, I think what's funny, I think that that's a part of book four was uh, I have this section where I'm talking about, you know, Christian guys and the problems that they have with the red pill. And I think the biggest problem that most like, and I don't want to just pick on, on, on Christian guys. It could be any moral absolutist, but the problem is, is that the guys who are like the players, the pickup artists, the game advocates, um, were the guys that had to tell them what female nature is really about and to mm. tell them that their I idealistic blue pill nature or their idealistic ideas about women according to their to their blue pill training they were the it, i think they resent the fact that it was like uh, a pua like say mystery who said you know this is i don't care if she's in bible study this is how women are and then they go holy shit he's right you know and just the fact that he's right and i was like oh i can't believe he's right <laughs> yeah and then they cheer on soft sierra law instead of saying girls are banned from driving it's well no man lets his girl drive he treats her like a princess i'm like a dude, real man doesn't do that yeah, that's soft sierra law <laughs> my girl my girl dresses in a garbage bag like come on dude our lap sack yes yeah, so, uh, <laughs> you you mean route, sharia, law? Or the sharia most, law yeah soft the muslim sharia. stuff yeah. well that's the thing they're just doing it but they want the girl to opt in so it's not their fault for like <laughs> oppressing her like dude yeah. Yeah, you you chose this lifestyle. Uh, okay, Glenn Lawrence, uh, five bucks says, or they say I am not that person anymore. Yeah, that's what I was. I was. <laughs> I was Power tour. Well, I was. I was uh, before you guys came on. I was talking about how the epiphany phase sort of works into all of the the sexual past and how women want to kind of. I think part of the epiphany phase. Uh, 
with, with respect to women, like psychologically is they want to get away from that sexual past. Like they want to, they want absolution of it. They were, I was so crazy in my sexual past and, and now I'm not like that anymore. Now I don't give head. Now I don't, you know, do these things. I don't take it in the butt. I don't, you know, those kind of <laughs> stuff because now they've matured and they've learned something more than, than, you know, oh, well, what they've learned is they couldn't lock down the alphas that they really wanted to get with. And they're not tingling yeah. for Bobby beta. Yeah. yeah. And that's the thing. They're, they're hundred percent honest. You don't have to ask a girl about her notch count when she says, I'm never going to do any of this stuff with you. And the guy's like, well, okay then. Yeah. Like, <laughs> like whose fault is that? Really? Yeah. Really? Well, again, it's the, it's the saving the best thing I was saying yeah. in the beginning of this is that the, uh, um, like I think guys, particularly blue pill beta male men think that because she said yes when he got on one knee and showed her the ring that he must therefore be the best that best option for her because otherwise she wouldn't have said yes to a lifetime with him so he must be uh he must be in line for the best sex that she would possibly be able to give him and then who would say no to a ten thousand dollar ring unless they really love the guy like yeah. what possible other incentive oh. would there be yeah. well, <laughs> you, know, I'm, you know i'm i'm speaking of saving the best here's the best thing is uh a lot of these guys then when they get into that marriage and they realize they're in a sex a sexless marriage then they become what we call awakened while married and they realize that that they they're not getting that sexual best and then they see the evidence of the guy see what the guys who came before them actually got because they can't escape their digital footprint they can't escape that did the uh, their sexual past literally online or whatever else those guys get really upset because the guy that that she you know willingly gave it up for and and uh the the alpha guy in her you know in her college years who didn't have to jump through any of these hoops who didn't have to put a ring on it who didn't have to you know have a steady job all that stuff and she gave him a degree of her sexual self that he will never get man that you wonder why guys get addicted to porn that's why they get addicted to porn because mm -hmm. it's at least it's virtual at least it's something that they can go oh well i can at least jerk off to this to what i would like to do with my wife but she won't do it with me but she was happy to do it with the alpha guy that didn't have have any rules to to get to that part of my wife that i will never have and that's what really fucks with these guys and that oh I, what really messes with them is right after when then she calls it cheating when he's looking at porn instead of watching her and getting shot down right right just talk about kicking a guy when he's down right uh, and that's tough and uh, and you want to know why guys go MGTOW right now you want to know why guys are like why i'm saying this and this is why women get pissed off at me right now because i'm making guys aware of this and saying like the reason why you're being shamed or the reason why you feel guilt for this is because women want to have absolution from that uh, let's see. Drape Timmons says, uh, too bad. We really can't get uh, a thought fax. I'll have a thought. Remember we said that fax thing. Okay. Uh, nimble night, uh, gave me 10 bucks. Nimble says uh, on topic, uh, girlfriend body count with less than 50 wild past. Didn't know about it until three months in currently with this girl for 10 months. Now she regrets her past wants me, but doesn't have the wild sex with me. Any advice? That's exactly. Have you been listening for the last two hours? Exactly <laughs> what you're talking about. Your advice is get out. Uh, take yeah, take a goddamn get guess. Out. <laughs> yeah, get out mm -hmm. and find a woman who actually has genuine desire for you. Where I again, this is a nimble. This is a really uh, good example of why I wrote uh, or why I put uh, uh, Iron Rule number three. Any time a woman makes rules for you. Anytime a woman uh, says, uh, I'm making you wait for sex or yep. by her actions implies that she's wait, making you wait for sex. Guess what? That is a woman making rules for you because there's something that is mitigating that. So in your situation right here, you know, she's got minus 50. She's got a, a, a pretty big body count, I guess, uh, you know, by I guess most people's standards. I don't know even what the standards are right now. Oh, dude, 50, even in my time, that was like whatever. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so anyways, my, my advice to you is get out. Uh, let's see. Uh, I got the, uh, WhatsApp gave me five bucks. Thanks for that. $5 from one man's way says is the three times rule legit. If she says it's only five, it's actually 15. <laughs> uh, I, I don't know. I, like a lot of guys will say you should double it. Uh, mm -hmm. some people will say you just add three to the actual, the actual number. Um, 
And, Guys and, tend to care when it's higher than theirs. So just assume yeah. it's twice yours. Yeah. I, I think here's the thing is it, it, I don't think it really matters like whether it's times this or plus that or whatever else. Just understand that if a woman has a higher body count, it means that she had a larger pool of guys with, from whom to become an alpha widow over. Keep that in the back of your head. Uh, Renegade Show says, one of my good friends, uh, thanks for the 20 bucks, man. Uh, one of my good friends married a woman who was 38 when he was 42. He is a great guy, owns his own business. Every time she gets mad at him, she throws the better men, uh, the better men excuse, uh, she was banging in her youth that she could have gotten with. Like women who actually use their sexual past as sort of like stamp collecting to say, hey, I could have got with a much better guy than you. RIP, baby. See you later. Go okay. find him. Yeah, and I'll find him. She's Comply using it because it works. Yeah. And you know what happens? As soon as you put a little bass in your voice and tell her to do that, watch how quickly she changes. <laughs> in your voice, I love bass. <laughs> uh, well, no, my... it's it's a serious thing. Like I was just saying in the chat, for a lot of guys, their girl cheats on them. Let's say a marriage, 10 years, whatever. Girl cheats, guy catches them, and he does something unexpected. He starts getting some self-dignity and starts leaving her. Yeah. A lot of girls do what's called we've called hysteric bonding. They start screwing him like the COVID antidote is in there. <laughs> And what happens is a lot of guys end up taking her back because this is what I've always wanted. And it's great. Now I forgive her. So we had to make guys aware, like be aware this hysteric bonding thing. This is because she has an extreme aversion to being left out in the cold right now. And she's doing this to keep you. It's like limbic brain. So like, I, like you said, when you put some bass in your voice, when you basically say that this is a boundary and I'm not putting up with it, you will be surprised how much enthusiasm you can get. Uh, Whether you want it at that point is another story. Omar Tabara says, have you read the book Marriage, a History by Stephanie Kunst? Uh, one, of no. points, one of the points in that book was that marriage was basically invented uh, was for land ownership and paternity. Yeah, that's exactly what I would yeah. expect from a feminist writer. Actually, marriage was, is, I mean, from a religious perspective, before there even was a such thing as, as land ownership, because remember, land ownership was post-agrarian pre-agrarian people still got married pre-agrarian so um pre-agrarian wise is uh remember marriage was intended to be a buffer against the worst aspect right. of each sex's mating strategy so women cuckoldry men uh you know sleeping around on the outside too so you know, they would eat, you know each each sex's mating strategy has an upside and a downside and i think that our social uh Constra our, our social mechanisms such as marriage are are really there to uh, buffer the worst aspects of that. So, uh, Amy Army Parrot says, Rolo, uh, if an uh, ex cock carousel rider tells you that she is rational and balanced, but not before with others, but not before with others, and also if she had met you five years ago, she would not be in the right mindset for an LTR beta in waiting. Um, yes yes that's what it you, sounds like i just wanted to jump in there yes there you go uh how to hustle says uh a friend 26 good looking six foot five damn successful been in uh, ltr for two years she's 29 she's a four of ten uh she is pushing hard for kids and marriage is there uh, a chance that she might get pregnant accidentally yes <laughs> she will get pregnant accidentally uh women who are like, I don't know what the, what you would consider this guy, but women who are anywhere between, uh, oh, we had, I guess we lost Ryan. Bye, Ryan. Thanks. Dinner time. Dinner time. <laughs> uh, uh, women who are anywhere between one and two points below you in uh, sexual market value, there is always that threat point of an act, a accidental pregnancy. Oh, yeah. uh, let's see, Richard. Uh, let's, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Black Sheep again says, Oh, wait, we already did jam. So uh, Black Sheep says, do guys hold any responsibility? Okay, we talked about that one. Richard says, do to those who have a girlfriend or wife, do you know her notch count or is it uh, or is it don't ask, don't tell? How do you navigate? Uh, I, I Well, she told me hers, but when I look, this is how I'm pretty sure I believe her. She, I'm number three for her, apparently, right? Mm -hmm. But... A, she literally lives in the middle of a rice field in the fucking boonies of, <laughs> of Nara Prefecture. And B, for the first six months that we had sex, every single time it bled. There was, there was blood everywhere. 
every single time. And it's like for six months. So, you know, that's the only girl that's ever happened to me that I've, that I've ever experienced that like excessive bleeding. And she said it would hurt a lot too. So, you know, um, I believe her, but I also don't care because she's good enough in the sense that she, she takes care of all my laundry. She massages me. She does all my Japanese tax paperwork and all the garbage that I don't want. I'd have to read kanji and stuff to deal with. She has never denied me sex to this day. She's enthusiastic in bed. She is a perfect vacation companion. She packs all my luggage. She unpacks all my luggage when we're out on trips. Like she's just like the like you know you see the typical Asian the 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 bad villain with like the Asian sidekick. That's like, you know, does everything for him, like Lex Luthor in uh, the recent Batman movie, etc. Mm -hmm. That's what she is for me. So, I mean, but yeah, she has technically confessed and I kind of verified it because I've been with, you know, I've been with over 100 chicks. So, you know, I have a little bit of experience in that department. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. Uh, Shivang says, a scene in Australia, girls get uh, implants at age 15. <laughs> no, they don't. You can't get implants at 15. Oh my uh, get God. On a carousel at two to three carousel, two to three guys a month end up crossing 50 notches before they even exit their twenties end up looking five plus five years, uh, of their original age. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Giuseppe, Giuseppe says, I got a peaceful solution. Are you Giuseppe, you're not going to tell us that we shouldn't ban or shouldn't repeal the 19th. I got a peaceful solution to gender wars. Men respect women's choices and women respect masculinity and guys. Good luck with that. Uh, I think this is a practical solution. Yeah, it's, it sounds very rational and reasonable. I'm sure it does. Uh, we need to teach women to respect, admire men's masculinity, competence, and teach women femininity. Uh, what we need to do is not teach them the opposite of that. Uh, right now, it's, I think I think women have a natural affinity for masculinity and a natural uh, they know about femininity. Yeah, there's a learned aspect of it as well. But the problem that you're, we're, I think that we're running into these days is that we teach women to uh, go against that, to go against yeah. the natural proclivities. It's it's not about teaching them to respect men and, and admire masculinity. They do. It's teaching them not to respect it and not to admire it and to presume that men are all ridiculous buffoons like we've been teaching them for going on 30 or 40 years right now and it's everywhere too it's in the music it's in the yeah. music videos it's in the tv shows it's netflix it's in the government like i went to I, when i go back to america rollo mm -hmm. i don't know how often you, you're at airports i'm a I'm global gal i global galvan a lot mm -hmm. but i saw these advertisements in the i think it was in the the tech in the houston airport and mm -hmm. they're like don't let sexual assault happen on your plane. And I'm just like, are, are we going for like Me Too airplane version now? Like it's it's like who is sexually assaulting someone on the plane? You can't even run away. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's everywhere. It's everywhere. Right. Uh let me keep going here. Um let's see. Okay, I answered that one. Oh, as a father myself, oh, this is Alex. He says, as a father myself, Rich Rolo, sorry, Rich is out now, but uh, Rich Rolo teachings, what would you tell your daughters? Pretty much what I'm saying right now is something I have yeah. told my daughters before. I, my daughters, my daughter already. And my daughter does not have like an Instagram account where she's showing off her ass. She doesn't have an OnlyFans thing. She's yeah. not even, she's not showing herself off in a bikini or any of this other crap. I okay. can confirm. I've seen it. And yeah. you you know, know, I was shocked at how daughter. like, uh, you're like it you're how you raise your daughter like first of all I definitely can tell you love the shit out of her second of all like she's she's beautiful but like she like she does it right she's like not in a slutty mm -hmm. way and she's like and she's very attractive but i don't even see cleavage on her photos mm -hmm. i don't see her ass pic not like no michaela peterson nonsense like none of that well, so what happened because she knows that too and she, i she knows everything that i've said in this in this podcast in this in this stream right now she i've said to her yeah. said you will not be be careful what you do online i work online i've worked online pretty much most of my career now and the internet doesn't forget. Don't put any, I told her this, like when she was little, I told her this when she was like seven or eight years old. I said, never put anything online that you wouldn't want to see on the Jumbotron at Amway Arena. That was when we lived in Orlando. In Orlando, I don't know the Amway. <laughs> never, I think, we were, I think we were actually watching the show. I said, never put anything online, never say anything you wouldn't want to see up on, on the Jumbotron. 
And I think that kind of sunk in because she was looking at it at the time. And and it, it still applies today. The, you, you're not going to be able to get away from your digital footprint. End of story. Yeah. So even after you're dead, you won't be able to get away from your your digital footprint. That's how people will perceive you. So can we can we give the can we give them an example? I'm going to show them Michaela Peterson's Instagram real sure, quick. Sure, sure. Take a look. If you got a, a a wife that's posting like this, guys, this is a massive, massive, red massive red flag. Okay, here she is, and the, like there's there's the husband in the background. Don't mind me. Don't mind him. But like legit, like you can't scroll down a single row without seeing her posting. Like even this is like supposed to be innocent. Like, dude, are you? Can you put some clothes on? Yeah, the reason I I meant I, the reason you marry a woman is to have exclusive sexual access to her. But when you're doing stuff like this, it's just like it's an embarrassment, and it's it looks poorly upon you, your family, and more importantly. You know her friggin' father to top it all off. The guy's recovering in rehab, and people are gonna look at her, and people are gonna say, "Wow, she looks like a slut. She looks like a whore. She looks like a thought." Like you can try to woke patrol all you want, but people are gonna think and say that. It's just human nature. Well, I and and a lot of people, and I and I know uh, a, a few choice people who think, "Oh, well, Rolo's daughters, she she does pageants and stuff like." That. I say, you know what? You should you. You want your daughter to do a pageant. The, all those good, wholesome girls that are supposed to have confidence and be be uh, learn how to like uh, like etiquette, I guess, or learn how to learn how to speak, learn how to yeah, all of, all of the the value added qualities that we always say that women don't have. You're gonna find that in girls who actually are competitive in the in pageant systems. Pageants that's, are classy. That's how I know, right? Pageants are classy. It's it it's yeah. like they're comparing a pageant to a girl. Who is literally posting her ass on Instagram for free? Not even competing. They don't. They don't figure. Out, they don't calculate that a girl's pageant. She has to do her hair. She has to do her teeth. She has to make sure she's so in good shape to, yeah. to look good in the bikini. She has to make sure she's well spoken. Make sure she enunciates correctly. I mean, there's like there's tons and tons of preparation. Yeah, well, and then that. there's and you have to have a platform. You don't understand that. Like, we, I think what a lot of people do is they see like these ditzy, stupid blonde girl. I, I what's what I hate about the pageant system right now is it's very uh, very SJW right now. It's very politically correct. It's very feminist. But it didn't used to be. It used to be like about like teaching women like how to how to talk, how to present themselves, how to be, uh, how to carry in a conversation, to answer questions, to be you know well rounded. It wasn't just a girl walking up on you know an evening wear or in a, on a swimsuit. There's a lot more that goes along with that. The only part that anybody sees is what they put on TV because you know sex sells, right? But right. there's a lot more that goes along with that. And I'll tell you that the the <laughs> here's the thing is. No pageant girl could have a Instagram account like Michaela Peterson. No one, none of them can because if they did, they get disqualified from the pageant system because that's not because it reflects poorly on the pageant system. Mm -hmm. So if you had your OnlyFans thing, or if you had some, you know, uh, you know, what's you know, selling your ass on Snapchat or something like that, you would get disqualified from that. That's actually what it's about. So, you know. I don't know. People, people want to throw rocks. They can throw rocks. You just simply are uneducated. James Gunn says, what happens when facial recognition? Okay, we talked about that one, YOLO. We already talked about you. Um, let's see. Uh, last but not least, I think we are done. I'm just going to call it here. I, I, I got okay. everything else. Um, one last thing I want to, uh, I, I'm glad I have you on for this one. My bonus question for today is I got a, um, I got a, a, a another, um, was it a Reddit a Reddit post? I, I won't read it for you, but it's a, a Reddit thread that somebody sent me. And a guy, uh, I'll just I'll just read the thing. Is are your hobbies killing your game? Right? What hobbies do you have? Do you have nerdy hobbies? And do your nerdy hobbies affect your relationships? And do your nerdy hobbies? And I'm talking nerdy hobbies. Let's say like hobbies in general, your passions in general, like, like hobbies, lightsaber collecting. Lightsaber collecting. <laughs> uh, God, I'll, I'll throw this out there. Um, let me just, I'll just read this. It's easy just to simply read uh, this guy. Okay, so this was on Am I the Asshole? It says, am I the asshole for throwing away my 33-year-old boyfriend's Lego toys? Yes, I'm aware how stupid and ridiculous this whole situation is. I, 29 female, have been with my boyfriend, Tom, for nearly two years. He works with computers. He has normal life, normal social, normal social life, job, until you get to the Lego figures. 
His house is normal, except for the fact that he has an entire room dedicated to Lego models and fake buildings. Lately, the subject of getting engaged has cropped up, but Tom was, wasn't keen on the idea. He uh, said it was too soon. We have some trust issues, meaning she probably cheated on him, due to a drunken mishap on my part a few months uh, ago. Yeah, but that's in the past. Right, we shouldn't care about the past now, and uh, not uh, and not why I'm here. It's just for context, so please don't base your answer on that. Uh, yeah, I will. Due uh, due to a lot of stress in my life right now and financial stress due to becoming unemployed, probably because of COVID, I decided that I should move into Tom's house. It's a three bed detached house with a nice garden. Tom's job is super well paying, of course. So it really shouldn't be a problem. Now, of course, this sort of coincides with everything we've been talking about in the show about how like, when a woman gets to like, say she's 29 years old, right? Entering yeah. the epiphany phase right there. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, when I asked him, uh, he got all weird and said there was no, there was no room. He has three bedrooms. So I argued this and he said he's not ready and that he needs the rooms for his Legos. <laughs> oh, what yeah, a bitch. Yeah, I know, right. And he said uh, he needed time to fully trust me and that he wasn't ready to rush into things. Now, here's where it gets really good. This is the funniest part of this. I told him I would never notice if half of those Legos disappeared into thin air because he has hundreds. He said, I'm exaggerating and claimed he knows every single piece he's ever bought. So I'll admit I was already feeling pretty hurt that he didn't want me uh, moving in and didn't trust me. So I decided to put his claims to the test to see if he was just making excuses. I grabbed a trash bag and he sh and show uh, and he showered uh, and he showered and I filled it well, while he showered. I filled it with Legos from a different room. I took them home and dumped them in the trash. The next morning, I got a call from Tom accusing me of stealing his Legos. I denied it at all, uh, denied it at first because I panicked, but it turns out that Tom's security camera <laughs> caught me taking the bag to the car. I thought he would understand that I was uh, hurt, or I thought he would understand that I was hurt, but he is threatening to sue me for the losses he claims amount to $6,000. <laughs> There's no way in hell any of these things I took were worth that. Actually, they probably were. Yeah, and bro. I definitely can't pay that kind of money. It's fucking building blocks for Christ's sake. Tom said he can prove he can prove it and will be filing for the losses and has asked for his key back. Am Good. I the asshole for this? I didn't. Good for Tom. Yeah. Good for Tom. I didn't think he would notice. I thought he would realize then that uh, I did or he didn't really need them and maybe expose the Lego as a cover up for not wanting to progress our relationship now that the relationship is over because of some toys. Am I the asshole? Yes, you are the asshole. You are the asshole. You are I mean, definitely the bro, asshole. Bro, I would, bro, I get mad at my girlfriend if she moves my shoes. Like, <laughs> like, uh, are you kidding me? Like, that's just like, is, I'm just gonna assume, that's like, that's like the typical delusional American woman, how she is just so entitled and up her ass in her own personal agenda. Like, I'm ready to quit my job. I'm ready to move in. He makes enough money. He could support me. I don't like his Lego habit. And, you know, but good for Tom because, A, he probably doesn't trust her if he's checking his security cameras mm -hmm. for her criminal back activity. And, like, dude, if a girl wants you to ch – listen, guys, my girl in, two in 2015, she said, listen, you need to choose – ModernLifeDating.com or me. And I was like, sayonara, baby. I was like, she was been thanks for the pussy. It was great. But I mean, you're you know, I, no. Hey, I wanna um I wanna throw this out there because I'm thinking about doing a full dedicated show to guys and their hobbies and compatibility. And probably I, you know what, I'll probably do it on on Wednesday. I know some other guys wanted me to do a show on uh Perfect is boring, and I'll still do that. I did see that. Thanks, guys. Uh, but I'll just say this right now because we're running out of time. But I, uh, I think that when it comes to hobbies and it comes to your passions, women will never understand you as a guy, like what you're interested in and what you like. And yeah. because uh, particularly with American women, you're, you're correct in this. It's certainly a cultural thing. It's a westernized women, let's just say. Yeah. Um, your hobbies 
unless that hobby has or passion, whatever you want to call it, what whatever your hobbies are, unless it has a direct or an indirect benefit to that woman, that she's going to hate it because it's something that takes you away from her. It's something that, uh, you know, again, she's most women, most Western entitled women are they you know, they're entitled. They're entitled to your your time. They're entitled to you entertaining them all the time. And the reason I brought this up as sort of the bonus question is because a lot of guys are throwing this one at me right now while they're in quarantine. Because mm -hmm. what they're saying is that now that they get into quarantine and they have to live together with their wife 24-7 or whatever, that their hobbies that are that they, they're they're quite happy to be doing their maybe uh you know their artistic stuff or their or playing music or or whatever it is that they're into that that is taking time away from entertaining their woman who really doesn't have any other interests who doesn't have anything else beyond like you know watching whatever television show she's watching her friends and what was going on at work which is no longer going on now yep. and so what takes that you know now now all that stuff that she tolerated becomes intolerable right now and i just i'll just leave you guys with this is that um yes in some ways your hobbies you for, don't expect a woman to be into your hobbies i know that, and when i talk about this on wednesday I'll, I'll get into the gamer girl dynamic where like girls who want to be uh you know they i'm i'm into games or i'm into what you're into or or uh you know, I'm into your sports team or I'm into your music and stuff like that. There's a that's there's a good part to that, but there's also a bad part to that because once you get to a point where the the pretense goes away, then it's all about your own identity. Because what women will do is they will shit test you and say, How important is that are your Legos to you? Exactly like this girl did here. Yeah. Right. Now, okay, you can say, Well, Legos, that, I mean, that's kid stuff, right? Okay, well, fine, but that's what he's into. That's his thing. Yeah, other than that, he has a perfectly, she just said, she has a perfectly normal life. He's a good, he wants, she wants to move in. She cheated on him. Okay, well, you know, that's, you know, he, he should have left her for that in, in the but first if, place. But. If you have a hobby, I like to play video games, right? Mm -hmm. And you know what, Miss MLD, she just got, you know what this is? She's got one of these. <laughs> I, I bought it for her. This is a Nintendo Switch, uh -huh. okay? She likes playing video games now. I like watching John Jones fight MMA. She likes John Jones fight and watching John Jones fight MMA. I like the Marvel movies. She loves to go to the Marvel movies with me. She likes to get popcorn. I like Star Wars. She she likes Star Wars. I hate Kathleen Kennedy. She hates Kathleen Kennedy. <laughs> what do you mean? Wait, what, is so, uh, what is the the? I think the rule is that women will imprint on the strongest male that is in their life. Yes. And so, like, suddenly, like, if, if I'm into Slayer and and death metal, then the girl that li likes me suddenly takes a liking to Slayer and death metal, whatever, um, that kind of stuff. Um, so, I, I think I'm going to save that for Wednesday. But just know now that, like, as one of the things is, is, if a woman is testing you, saying it's either the hobby or it's me, always take the hobby. Don't take the girl because what that is is that that's a shit test, as a really major shit test. But what it is is it's you changing your identity to suit that person and guys will do this all the time like yeah i, I collect comic books so i want you to sell them all I, I play with legos still i'm into legos and collectible legos and i got six thousand dollar legos over here i want you to sell them all because if you don't then you know then you're still you're not the guy that i want you to be if yeah. she's asking you to do that guess what you're not answering the hypergamous question which is is he the best i can do yeah. right and so when women say, oh, we're working on a relationship and the guy goes, yeah, we're working on a relationship. That's the, that guy who's saying that that guy is the one who is giving up his identity. It's, it's, we're working on him is what we're doing. We're trying to turn him into what she has this ideal on the back of her head. And guess what? He's never going to be that. He, she needs to you either split up or you need to cling to your identity as tenaciously as you possibly can because it's that tenacity. It's that I'm not changing for you. Take it or leave it. This is me. I play with Legos. I do this. Whatever it is that you do, uh, remember that your hobbies are going to be uh, – women will accept your hobbies if they are something that, that gets an indir a direct or an indirect benefit. So if your hobby is like playing basketball with the boys after work, Man, they're probably fine with that. They love that because you you get hot and sweaty and you stay in shape, right? Or your hobby is going and lifting weights. Okay, that that's probably just fine. Your hobby is playing with six thousand dollars worth of Legos. She's probably gonna have a problem with that. And I'm not saying yeah. you give that up. I'm just saying that there's there is a like that's that's part of women's entitlement 
ideals. So just keep that in mind. I'll talk about that on Wednesday. Thanks, man. Thanks for joining me today. And yeah, you're welcome for joining me. I know you got a uh, body language mastery coming up. So why not go give a plug, man? Well, we body language mastery. The we're closed. Enrollments closed. It'll be open again sometimes in summer. So I'm just helping all the guys out. I mean, Rolo came in there. He privately yeah. spoke to about 105 different guys. Um, I'll, be in again. I'll be in again too. So. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, we're projecting by quarter four. We're gonna have anywhere between three to five hundred guys in the webinar. Mm. So um, it's really it's it's awesome to like. You know, because we have such a one-way communication style with with mm -hmm. just us in the chat, we can interact a little bit. But it's nice to see their faces, yeah, see their struggles, hear their what they're going through, and be able to help them. Yeah, I have a lot of guys that will like say, "Hey, Rolla, do you do counseling and stuff like that?" And yeah, I do. Just to answer the question, if you guys are interested in counseling, that's fine. You can hit me up, right, especially right now because we're in the quarantine, and I, I'm writing the book and. I'm playing a little music and I'll be happy to answer and that. That's basically all I'm doing right now and these shows. So um, I'm trying to actually get the lighting in here. Can you tell that the lighting's different? In, in yeah, the, everybody, I don't know if you saw it earlier in the chat. Everybody's like, Roll looks like he's 36. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah strategic lighting thing. Uh, but no, I'm, I'm, I, I do have time. So if you, if anybody wants counseling, uh, email me. It's rtrationalmail at gmail.com. Uh, and so, yeah, I do that, but it, if I go on with you, you can get it right then and there. So, you know, people are asking me questions from your, your get together. So we can yep. do that as well. All right, guys. So Wednesday I'll be on a uh, regular time. It'll be one thirty um, one thirty Pacific, uh, three 30 Eastern time. And, uh, I'm, I think I might do hobbies, I guess on the next one. Uh, other than that, I am still working on the book. Um, and again, I, if, even if I had it ready right now, I couldn't send it to the printer because of all the shit that's going down. Uh, but stay safe. Um, and uh, thank you for watching. Also, guys, uh, if you haven't hit the subscription button, please do. Uh, the best thing you can do, of course, is to simply copy the URL and put it into a, a Twitter post, uh, on your blog, on Facebook posts, anywhere on your social media. That helps me out a lot. Also helps the rest of these guys out as well. So I uh, had kind of a mini Rule Zero today. It was a lot of fun. Thanks for, thanks for joining me, man. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. All right, man. I'll see you guys later. Bye-bye.